A long, long time ago, video games were simple. By and large, arcade and home console games were all about fast-paced, pick-up-and-play games that focused on scoring points. But even in those old days, the people who made games frequently searched for ways to make them something more. In the late 70s and early 80s in the US, home video games were Atari. Competitors existed, but the bulk of the video game mindshare was focused on Atari's wood grain machine, and this was largely thanks to its popular home conversions of arcade hits. But even here, those high scores slowly began giving way to more complex titles like Adventure, Sword Quest, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. These games focused on completing specific objectives, not for points, but to quote-unquote beat the game. Of course, lots of games like this were cropping up elsewhere in the world, even in the US on home computers, but for the console gamer, these games were their first taste of what was to come. Unfortunately, the US gaming market crashed, and players looking forward to the next big thing in terms of video game evolution were out of luck. That is, of course, until Nintendo arrived. The Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, was largely responsible for revitalizing the North American video game market coupled with Super Mario Bros., a game that looked, played, and sounded light years beyond anything the home console market had to offer before it. It took off in a big way, but little did NES owners know Super Mario Bros. was just the tip of the iceberg. Over in Japan, the Famicom, the Japanese equivalent to the NES, had already outgrown Super Mario Bros. The introduction of the Famicom Disk System gave players overseas access to games that had evolved beyond even Super Mario's abilities. Back in the States, though, the disk system never made it to market thanks to the introduction of special chips that allowed game makers to create larger scale adventures without the need for new hardware. These games largely started making their way to the US market in 1987, where our story begins. Video games were indeed starting to change. Games like Konami's Castlevania, Tecmo's Rygar, and Capcom's Trojan kicked off 1987 on the platform by introducing players to new worlds with considerably more depth than most of what had come before them. Nintendo themselves hammered this evolution of console games home through a trio of releases, Kid Icarus, Metroid, and arguably the most influential of all, The Legend of Zelda. While Kid Icarus and Metroid broke with Nintendo's traditional black box branding with silver backdrops, denoting that they were password packs, The Legend of Zelda took things a step further. Zelda came in gold, and not just the box, but the cartridge itself. The Legend of Zelda was special, and Nintendo knew this thanks to the game's pre-existing success in Japan. They began communicating this with players in a number of ways. Their official publication, the Nintendo Fun Club Newsletter, featured Zelda as its cover story on both its second and third issues. Combining that with TV commercials and word of mouth from those who had managed to play it at trade shows or in its native country, Japan, the game had all the makings of an instant hit. The Legend of Zelda was finally released in the US in August 1987, and as expected, was instantly one of the most popular titles on the platform. But even if you had managed to see all this beforehand, the magazine articles, the shiny box, the commercials, nothing could have prepared players for that first moment they plugged their gold cartridges into their NES consoles and powered them on. Where for the most part, title screens of the time were accompanied by little more than a few options and maybe a catchy jingle, The Legend of Zelda instantly transported players to a mystical new world. Even Nintendo's own Kid Icarus and Metroid title screens, for as great as they were, couldn't match the unbelievable feeling that Zelda gave off, that you were about to embark on something truly new. This continued the moment you pressed start and were prompted to create a save file. The Legend of Zelda was the first NES game to feature battery-backed saves, so you didn't have to try and finish the entire adventure in one sitting. This was something that computer games had been able to do for a while, but for home console players in the US sitting in front of their televisions, this was a revelation that cannot be overstated. Saving your progress now is a given, but back in 1987, it changed everything. The Legend of Zelda was more than just an in-depth video game. Like Super Mario Bros. before it, Zelda delivered in every way a video game could back then. The visuals were attractive and ran smoothly, the sound effects were memorable and suited the gameplay perfectly from the sound of a bomb exploding to the roars of boss characters coming from the next room. 
The music, too, was a revelation, with Koji Kondo's compositions eliciting a sense of adventure and mystery at every turn, filling players' ears with a level of musical complexity that very few games before it had even come close to. Zelda also came with lore, and lots of it. The game itself tells a brief version of the story, but if you opened up the included instruction manual, you were treated to a gorgeously illustrated look into the events that put protagonist Link in the position he found himself in in the first place. The land of Hyrule was in despair. An evil army led by Ganon had stolen the Triforce of Power, a piece of a mystical and all-powerful relic. Its counterpart, the Triforce of Wisdom, belonged to Princess Zelda, who Ganon had kidnapped in order to gain control of both Triforces. Zelda was smart, though, because she managed to break the Triforce of Wisdom into eight fragments and spread them across the land. She entrusted her nursemaid, Impa, with finding a hero who would travel across Hyrule, gather the Triforce pieces together, and defeat Ganon once and for all. She found a young boy named Link who came to her aid when she was attacked by monsters, and thus began the adventure. And what an adventure it was. With a sprawling overworld and nine underground labyrinths to explore, The Legend of Zelda confronted players with a quest far more complex than anything they had faced before. Fortunately, there were also a number of tools that Link could use to help on his quest. A boomerang to stun enemies, keys to open doors, new tunics to increase his defense, and of course, an enchanted arrow imbued with the power to destroy Ganon. It was a massive undertaking, but one that resonated with players enough to kick off the beloved franchise that it is today. The game came with a mini strategy guide, but it only scratched the surface. Players everywhere created their own maps with pens and paper, and told one another about the secrets they found throughout their adventure. Hidden optional items were scattered everywhere, which only helped increase the level of interest players had in sharing their experiences. There was even a second quest that rearranged the map and increased the difficulty for those clever enough to actually finish the game, which itself was a daunting task. The Legend of Zelda on the surface appeared open and inviting, but there was no clear direction on where to go. Not only was it easy to get lost in the game's massive open world, but the monsters and puzzles within were deviously challenging. In spite of this challenge, or perhaps even because of it, The Legend of Zelda was a massive success. It redefined what a console game could be and continued to propel Nintendo's popularity into the stratosphere, but it was about to face its first real test. How do you follow up a game like The Legend of Zelda? Apparently, you go back to the drawing board. Zelda II The Adventure of Link was released in September 1988 and was anything but what fans expected. Almost every aspect of the game had changed. It was now a side-scrolling action platformer instead of a top-down action adventure. It focused on in-depth combat over puzzle solving, but just because it was different didn't necessarily mean it was bad. The standards set in the first game for audio and visual design were well maintained for the sequel. The sound effects were more visceral than ever, with Link letting out an audible grunt when he took damage, and the memorable sound of a shield blocking a sword can no doubt still be heard in the minds of players of a certain age today. The music this time was composed by Akito Nakatsuka and complemented the game's more action-based style. The graphics were considerably more intricate, featuring increased details and animations for Link and the various monsters he encountered. And speaking of monsters, the bestiary was more dangerous than ever, with enemies approaching Link with complex attack patterns and higher offensive and defensive capabilities. Every dungeon consisted of unique tile sets and featured its own distinct boss. Link could learn new moves like the jump and downward thrust maneuvers, and in addition to new weapons and tools, Link could utilize magic spells to help him along his quest. Even Hyrule itself was more expansive and alive than ever before, featuring multiple landmasses to explore and a number of towns spread across them, each one full of its own citizens, secrets, and history. This expansion also applied to the game's lore, which went deeper than before. The instruction manual featured even more detailed illustrations and a story that directly followed up on the events of the original game. After defeating Ganon, Link returned to Hyrule Castle to find the land once again in peril. Ganon's minions were determined to resurrect their fallen king by killing Link and using his blood in a revival ritual. 
Link had been doing his part to help fend off the monsters, but around his 16th birthday, the mark of not two, but three triangles appeared on his hand. When Link went to ask Impa about it, she told him what at the time was known as the actual Legend of Zelda. The princess you saved in the first game was only one of many princesses given that name over the years. One such princess had been cursed ages ago, and the key to waking her up was also the key to preventing Ganon's return. By returning crystals to several statues hidden across the land, Link could gain access to a heretofore unmentioned third Triforce, the Triforce of Courage, which when united with the Triforces of Power and Wisdom would unleash their full potential. This, players would learn, was no easy task. The Legend of Zelda was by no means an easy game, but by comparison, Zelda 2 made it look like child's play. The aforementioned battle system required a level of play that the first game rarely approached, with the difficulty ratcheting up to a frankly absurd degree by the time Link reached the final palace. Difficulty and genre shifts aside, Zelda 2 was also a huge hit for Nintendo. It introduced a number of series mainstays, like the manual stating that Link is left-handed, several names of areas in the game showing up later in the series, a magic system, and the all-important third Triforce. Its success also cemented Zelda as one of Nintendo's most important brands right next to the likes of Mario and Donkey Kong. Zelda was here to stay, and players couldn't wait to see what was next for the hero of Hyrule. But just like Zelda 2, Link's next adventure wasn't quite what they expected. In August 1989, Link embarked on his first handheld adventure in a game simply called Zelda. This was a dual-screen Game & Watch game that drew its inspiration from both The Legend of Zelda and Zelda II The Adventure of Link. According to the game's manual, Hyrule had been harassed by eight dragons, who have somehow kidnapped Zelda and now each possess a shard of the Triforce of Wisdom. Link has to track them down and rescue the princess from evil once again. Its outward appearance bears more of a resemblance to the first game with Link's artwork depicting him with a more squat appearance and crossed swords similar to the ones seen on the first game's title screen. However, the gameplay itself was more in line with Zelda 2 in that it plays out from a 2D perspective. Link has to face off against goblins in a similar fashion to how he fought in Zelda 2, except now he has to contend with Stalfos trying to stab him from a lower level during battle. Each goblin you defeat will open up a staircase that leads to another chamber with another goblin. Eventually you will come across the correct staircase to face off against a dragon. Defeat a dragon, and you get a Triforce piece added to your inventory. Reunite the Triforce in full, and Zelda will be free. While not unsuccessful by any means, the Zelda Game & Watch didn't have nearly the same impact as its console counterparts. Still, the idea of taking Zelda on the go was an enticing one, and fans who managed to get their hands on one no doubt enjoyed themselves. What did make an impact, though, came just one month later. Hey, paisanos! It's the Super Mario Brothers Super Show! With the Mario Brothers. In September 1989, the first episode of the Super Mario Brothers Super Show aired in the U.S., bringing Nintendo's plumbing mascot to TV screens across the country every weekday after school. Monday through Thursday, the Super Mario Brothers Super Show featured bizarre live-action segments starring Mario and Luigi portrayed by professional wrestler Captain Lou Albano and Canadian character actor Danny Wells. These segments introduced animated episodes of the Super Mario Brothers cartoon. Every Friday, though, they changed things up by airing an episode of the Legend of Zelda cartoon instead. The show played pretty fast and loose with the established lore, but featured loads of music and sound effects from the games. It wasn't perfect, but it captured the imagination of kids everywhere and coined the memorable catchphrase, Excuse me, princess. One month after the debut of the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, Nintendo and Nelsonic Technologies released Link's second portable adventure, this time in the form of The Legend of Zelda Game Watch. Not to be confused with the Zelda Game & Watch, The Legend of Zelda Game Watch was an LCD game stuffed into a literal wristwatch. Considerably more simplistic than even the Game & Watch game, this game features very little by way of story. Basically, Link enters a cave for some reason and has to fend off bats and iron balls before defeating a dragon that clearly resembles Aquamentus from the original Legend of Zelda on NES. Each dragon you defeat gains you one more Triforce piece, and you play until either you collect them all or you die. 
Zelda doesn't appear to be involved in this game at all. It's pretty basic, but it did return Zelda to its original overhead perspective, which gave players a sense that they were playing a genuine portable version of the game they knew and loved. Zelda being on a watch was just one of many things that showed that by this point, Zelda had permeated popular culture in nearly every way Nintendo and Mario had. Bedsheets, garbage cans, t-shirts, anything Nintendo could license, they slapped Zelda and or Mario onto. The Zelda franchise was riding high, and fans wanted more. The Zelda cartoon ran for 13 episodes, and in 1990, Valiant Comics picked up the rights to create and distribute comic books based on Nintendo properties, including The Legend of Zelda. These comics resembled the cartoon series in a lot of ways, including its portrayal of Zelda as more of Link's equal and dressing her in a more action-ready outfit, instead of the game series dresses and tiaras. But it also told unique stories that drew inspiration from the games. For as great as all this was for Zelda fans, though, what they really wanted was a new game. Not an LCD handheld, not a wristwatch, but the next great evolution of the series. They would have to wait another two years, but in 1992, Nintendo delivered not just one of the best sequels fans could have hoped for, but one of the finest games ever made. By the time The Legend of Zelda and Zelda II The Adventure of Link were at the height of their popularity, Nintendo was the undisputed market leader in North America. But by the dawn of the 1990s, the gaming landscape had changed considerably. Nintendo now had competition, most notably from Sega, who had started carving out a serious foothold in the gaming market with their 16-bit Genesis console. In the January 1991 issue of Nintendo Power, Nintendo gave fans their first glimpse of what their own 16-bit machine, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, would be capable of, with a particular spotlight on Super Mario Bros. 4, Super Mario World. This set imaginations running wild, wondering what other Nintendo series might be like with the power of 16-bit hardware behind them. But one question loomed above all else. What was next for The Legend of Zelda? Six months later, they would get their answer. In the July 1991 issue of Nintendo Power, on the back of a fold-out poster for Metroid 2 was a single screenshot for a game called Zelda 3. The wait for new information was agonizing for many fans as the internet wasn't widely available back then, and video game magazines typically only published once a month at best. By the time the Super NES launched in North America in August 1991, Nintendo had only officially released a total of three screenshots for the game. Very little information could be gleaned from these images, but a few things were obvious right away. The game had shifted back to an overhead perspective, and it was going to be absolutely gorgeous. In the January 1992 issue of Nintendo Power, Nintendo published the first chapter of a comic book adaptation for their upcoming new Zelda game. This, in addition to a consistent stream of new screenshots and information from various outlets, fueled the unbelievable level of anticipation for players to finally take control of Link once again. And just like before, nothing could have prepared them for what awaited when they plugged in their cartridges and turned them on. Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past released in April 1992 and exceeded even the loftiest of expectations. The game delivered in every way a proper sequel should, by combining the best of what came before it to create something new yet familiar at the same time. It played largely like an evolution of the original Legend of Zelda, especially in terms of camera perspective, but several of the advancements made in Zelda 2 were also taken into consideration. Link once again had to manage a magic meter and spells, non-player characters inhabited their own homes and spoke to Link when prompted, and unlike the original game's open-world approach, this was a more guided experience, giving players a much clearer idea about what to do next. Also like Zelda 2, A Link to the Past came with even more story than before, with the first several pages of the instruction manual dedicated to a richly detailed explanation of the history of Hyrule and the Triforce itself. Long ago, the Triforce existed in its own realm known as the Golden Land. 
Utilizing black magic, a gang of thieves found their way in, and their leader, Ganondorf Dragmire, found and took the Triforce for himself. Now known as Ganon, transformed by the power of gold, he waged war on Hyrule, but seven wise men were determined to stop him. The people of Hyrule forged a blade with the power to repel evil, which came to be called the Master Sword. As the wise men searched for someone worthy of wielding such a weapon, Ganon and his minions launched a devastating attack. It was then that the seven wise men managed to seal Ganon in the Golden Land, bringing an end to what was known as the Imprisoning War. Centuries later, Hyrule fell on hard times until a mysterious wizard named Aghanim appeared to seemingly save the day. The king named him chief advisor, and the people of Hyrule thought their troubles were over. Aghanim, however, soon took control of Hyrule Castle and began kidnapping maidens with the aim of freeing Ganon from his prison. Like the original games, most of this story is told within the game itself, but where the NES titles featured mere text crawls, the power of the Super NES allowed for much more detailed storytelling. It was a dark and stormy night, and Link was fast asleep. In his dreams, the voice of Princess Zelda contacted him and told him about Aghanim's sinister plans. When he awoke, he saw his uncle heading out into the storm with a sword. Link followed him, and his next great adventure began. Immediately, players were able to test their new abilities. Link could now move diagonally, pick up and throw items, open treasure chests, and change elevations by jumping from ledges. The rain effect was stunning, and paired with the crisp visuals and moody music, the stage was set for a truly epic quest. More new abilities were slowly introduced throughout the adventure, but none transformed the gameplay as much as the way Link wielded his sword. Where in previous games Link could only stab forward, he now swung in an arc that could damage in multiple directions at once. Combining this with Link's new diagonal maneuverability was a massive step up over the original game's rigid movement, and resulted in combat that felt more manageable than Zelda 1, but still rewarding like Zelda 2. Dozens of new items, clever puzzles, and multi-tiered dungeons unfolded as Link set out to recover three sacred pendants in order to lift the Master Sword which resided in the Lost Woods. Once the sword was found, players traveled back to Hyrule Castle to engage in what at first glance seemed to be the final battle against Aghanim, but upon his defeat, you learn that not only did you not finish the game, but you hadn't even gotten through a third of it. Link now had to find six crystals hidden throughout the Golden Land, which Ganon had transformed into the Dark World. This twisted version of Hyrule shared its basic iconography, but was distinct enough to keep players on their toes. The act of switching back and forth between Hyrule and the Dark World became the game's defining trait, and opened up the world to intricate puzzles that inspired not only future Zelda installments, but other Nintendo franchises for generations to come. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past was a critical and commercial success, and is still commonly ranked among the best games ever made. It laid the foundation for what the rest of the series would build on for decades, and as always, players couldn't wait to see what came next. And just like before, it wasn't at all what they expected. A group of engineers at Nintendo had been toying around in their off time to create a Zelda-style game for the Game Boy, Nintendo's new handheld gaming device. As development progressed, they eventually asked permission to turn it into an official handheld remake of A Link to the Past. This soon morphed into its own unique project, which ultimately became Link's first proper portable outing. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening released in the US in August 1993. On the surface, it bore more than a slight resemblance to A Link to the Past, including its nearly identical box art, general visual design, and basic gameplay. But upon booting up the game, it was immediately obvious that this was no mere port. Players were greeted by the most detailed image of Link ever seen in-game as he struggles to sail through a terrible storm. After lightning strikes his raft, he washes up on the shore of a mysterious island, where he's rescued by a familiar-looking girl. He soon learns that this island is called Kohilent, and the girl's name is Marin. According to the locals, nobody can leave Kohilent without waking something called the Windfish, which lies sleeping in a giant egg on top of a mountain at the center of the island. Once you leave Marin's house in search of your sword, it quickly becomes apparent that this is no normal Zelda game. First you encounter a dog named Bow Wow that is clearly a chain chomp from Super Mario Bros. 3. 
and then the urchins on the beach look suspiciously like Gordos from Kirby's Dreamland. When you find your sword, it has your name engraved on it, as does your shield, and the citizens of Mabe Village seem to be weirdly self-aware, informing you about things like how to save your game while not knowing what that means, and even telling you to keep an eye out for when they're lost in the mountains later. Link's Awakening was truly something different. Thanks to the limitations of the Game Boy hardware, the world once again had to be traversed one screen at a time, and since the Game Boy only had two face buttons to work with, inventory management was once again limited to just two slots. This time, though, both slots could be used to assign items, which allowed for some fun combinations, including ones that didn't involve Link's sword. Multi-tiered environments were back, but instead of just being able to jump down from ledges, Link could now jump at will thanks to an item called Rock's Feather. Also like Zelda 2, or more specifically the brief underground areas in Zelda 1, there were occasional side-scrolling segments. These actually had more in common with Super Mario Bros., not just because of the degree of platforming they required players to master, but because they featured literal Goombas, Piranha Plants, and Cheep Cheeps to contend with. Characters from Kirby, Sim City, and even the Japan exclusive The Frog for Whom the Bell Tolls were scattered throughout Koholint, whose lore seemed to have a lot to do with dreams, including a cameo from none other than Wart, the dream-stealing villain from Super Mario Bros. 2. As both Link and players would eventually learn, the implications of this were considerable. The story of Link's Awakening was very different from any Zelda game before it, you weren't out to rescue a princess from Ganon, and there was nary a mention of the Triforce. Link was just trying to get home. But the further players went into the adventure, the more they realized that this wonderful world they were a part of might just all be a dream, and if they wake up, or wake the Windfish, every living thing on Koholint would cease to exist. This was made all the more heartbreaking thanks to just how endearing the inhabitants of Koholint are, especially Marin, with whom Link becomes friends. The exact details of the game's bittersweet ending are open to interpretation, but they nevertheless left a lasting mark on Zelda fans while also expanding just what a Zelda game could be. This, combined with its stellar soundtrack by Kazumi Totaka, complex puzzles, and massive detailed world by Game Boy standards, cemented Link's Awakening as a fan favorite in the series and once again left players eagerly awaiting what was next for the hero of Hyrule. What they didn't know was that more Zelda was on the way far sooner than they could have imagined, and from a place nobody would suspect. Back in 1988, Nintendo partnered with electronics giant Sony to begin development of a CD-ROM add-on for their then-upcoming Super Famicom platform. This partnership resulted in the development of the Super NES CD-ROM, also known as the Nintendo PlayStation. Nintendo's partnership with Sony soured, though, so Nintendo turned to their rival, Philips, instead. This relationship, too, went south, and in December 1991, Philips released their own CD-based machine, the CDI. This was a multimedia device designed to work as a central hub for movies, music, pictures, and, of course, video games. Thanks to their previous contract with Nintendo, Philips found themselves with a brief window to create original games using Nintendo's IP, this resulted in a series of bizarre titles featuring Nintendo's most iconic characters that were never released on Nintendo platforms and didn't have any official involvement at all. One was a Mario game. The others were based on The Legend of Zelda. Link, The Faces of Evil was released in October 1993, just two months after Link's Awakening for Game Boy. However, since Nintendo was in no way involved, developer Animation Magic, who was already inexperienced in creating this kind of game, wasn't privy to the newest developments in the Legend of Zelda series. All they had to go on was what was out in the world already, and they drew inspiration from both Zelda II The Adventure of Link and the Legend of Zelda cartoon. CDI games weren't typically covered much in video games media at the time, so a large portion of what the general public knew of Faces of Evil came from a Philips CDI infomercial that often aired in the US. In it, a man named Phil is convinced that he can learn the meaning of life if he buys a CDI. One of the games he is given to convince him of this is Link the Faces of Evil. While it's easy to look at this today and focus on its lack of quality, back in 1993 this was still fairly impressive, especially to children who grew up on the NES games and the animated series. It featured full-motion video sequences with voice acting and CD-quality sound, and while the art direction no doubt looked a bit off, 
thanks to the series' pedigree, fans had reason to believe that it played better than it looked. The game begins when Link and the King of Hyrule are informed by a traveling wizard that Ganon has conquered the neighboring kingdom of Korodai, and that Link was the only one who could defeat him. He then set out on a quest to defeat the evil king's minions who were holed up in large stone statues called the Faces of Evil, and free the citizens of Korodai from Ganon's rule. Faces of Evil in no way lived up to the quality standards fans had come to expect from The Legend of Zelda, but the game wasn't without its merits. It turned the perspective on its side again like Zelda 2, though it dropped most of its RPG elements. There was a large map that you could navigate with a cursor and enter various areas featuring a number of monsters, shops, and other characters that Link could interact with in order to solve puzzles and advance the story. Unfortunately, controls were laggy and clunky, the enemies could deal catastrophic amounts of damage in less than a second, objectives were unclear, and even the simplest of tasks quickly became chores to complete. It was bad, and it wasn't alone. No! Not into the pit! It burns! On the same day, a second Zelda game called Zelda The Wand of Gamelon also released. This time, the King of Hyrule had traveled to the Kingdom of Gamelon to offer aid in their fight against Ganon's forces. When he didn't return, Zelda tasked Link with rescuing the king, but Link too soon vanished. So for the first time in the series, Zelda herself took up arms and ventured forth to save both her father and Link. Though the protagonist was different, the gameplay in Wand of Gamelon was nearly identical to Faces of Evil, only with different areas, items, and story elements to explore. While neither one of these games should be considered good, they were both admirably ambitious. They feature high-quality box art with imagery invoking the look of A Link to the Past, and some of the environments in-game contain detailed animations that made them feel alive. The characters you encountered throughout were indeed strange, but also quite creative, and while the music never reached the heights of Kondo's or Totaka's legendary scores, it was still pretty good on its own. Even with the hardware's extreme limitations, the team's inexperience, and the complete lack of guidance from Nintendo, Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon still stand as a fascinating, if tragically flawed, piece of Zelda's history. We were just about to have a feast. Great! <laughs> <laughs> Following this, The Legend of Zelda entered its longest drought period ever in the US. In Japan, there was a game based on A Link to the Past released for the Barcode Battler 2 system, and a number of releases for the BSX Satellaview, including a pseudo-remake of the original NES Legend of Zelda. While over in Europe, there was a third Zelda game on CDI called Zelda's Adventure, which featured live-action cutscenes, an overhead perspective, and is widely considered one of the worst games ever made. But here in the US, there wasn't a new game in the Legend of Zelda series released for five years. The wait, though, would ultimately prove to be worth it. The 16-bit console wars were coming to a close, and while the battle was fierce, Nintendo ultimately came out on top with the Super Nintendo Entertainment System outselling the Genesis in North America. But the next battle was about to begin, and with much more formidable opponents. The return of their longtime rival Sega, and their former business partner, Sony. Video games themselves were also about to go through their most significant intrinsic change since their inception. New hardware capable of rendering polygons may have taken things backwards in terms of graphical detail, but those simplistic designs came with a bold new ability, a freedom of movement unlike anything that had come before it. Harnessing this ability, though, would prove to be a challenge. The next generation kicked off in earnest as the Sega Saturn and the Sony PlayStation went head-to-head -head in 1995, with Nintendo's console still about a year away. Both platforms showcased their new polygon-pushing power with impressive-looking games, but they both suffered from the same problem, an inability to make the act of moving a character through a 3D environment feel intuitive, or more importantly, fun. Regardless, 3D gaming was no doubt the future of the industry, a fact that Nintendo was fully aware of. As such, they built their next-generation hardware to suit. In November 1995, Nintendo showed off the Nintendo 64 at their annual Shoshinkai trade show in Japan. There, players were able to go hands-on with Nintendo's solution to the 3D gaming problem, Super Mario 64. 
Just like in the 80s when Mario reset the standard in 2D platforming with Super Mario Bros., Super Mario 64 redefined 3D video games. Unlike the stiff, tank-like movements of earlier 3D attempts, controlling Mario felt natural thanks in part to the revolutionary analog stick on the Nintendo 64's controller and the game's creative new camera system. But even with the opportunity to experience the dawn of something as earth-shattering as Super Mario 64, elsewhere on the show floor a short tech demo was garnering its own share of the attention. The first footage of Zelda 64. Since widely accessible internet was still in its infancy, most of the world only got to see this footage as still screenshots in gaming magazines. But even that was enough to once again set the imaginations of Zelda fans ablaze as they wondered what a properly three-dimensional Zelda game could be like, especially after playing Super Mario 64. Unfortunately, the game was still a long way off. Over the next three years, the hype for Zelda 64 was built up to almost mythical levels. One year after the initial tech demo, Nintendo showcased the game again, this time in a form much more in line with what the final product would become. As time passed, more screenshots made their way to magazines. Countless think pieces were written about its progress, hypothesizing about the nature of the game. Eventually, the project was given its official name, and one thing had become undeniably certain. The world was finally ready for the next generation of Zelda. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time released in North America on November 23, 1998. Early adopters were treated to a special collector's edition featuring a reflective box and gold cartridge, hearkening back to the series' origins. But whether you got a gold cart or a gray one didn't ultimately matter. The game inside was the star of the show, and it once again exceeded expectations. From its moody title screen to its exciting cinematic intro sequence, Ocarina of Time immediately felt unlike anything else released to that point, and delivered as the futuristic evolution fans had been hoping for since Link's Awakening on Game Boy. The level of polish was apparent from the moment the game started, and it was somehow maintained straight through to the end. Moving Link around in 3D space felt just as natural as Mario, except with a few important refinements tailored to Link's particular gameplay needs. The camera could be centered behind Link at any time with the press of a button. Jumping was automated to context-sensitive situations in lieu of a dedicated button. But by far the most important new addition was a system called Z-Targeting. Represented by Link's new fairy partner Navi, players were able to lock the game's camera to a specific item or character by pressing the Z button. No matter where they went or what they did, Link's focus would always remain on whatever you had targeted. This allowed for a level of contextual control that few other 3D games had ever come close to achieving, and made Ocarina of Time considerably more approachable by mainstream audiences. Free aiming and camera movements were still available, but the minutia of managing the game's perspective, something 2D games rarely had to contend with, became automated, once again revolutionizing 3D gameplay. And the revolutions didn't stop there. Ocarina of Time introduced a day-night cycle, with different times hosting their own unique events and enemies. Elements of the soundtrack were procedural, changing at a moment's notice to match what was happening to the player in real time and the story, while not overly complicated, managed to tell a tale worthy of the term legend. This time, Link started the game as a child living in Kokiri Forest. After suffering a plague of nightmares, he is summoned by the Great Deku Tree, who tells him of an evil sweeping the land of Hyrule. After venturing inside the tree and defeating the monsters living within, the Deku Tree tells Link the true meaning of his quest. A wicked man of the desert was responsible for the monsters Link had just faced. His goal was to find the sacred realm where the Triforce resided and take the power for himself. The Deku Tree entrusted Link with the first of three spiritual stones and sent him off to Hyrule Castle to meet Princess Zelda. There, she informed Link that the man the Deku Tree had told him about was a thief named Ganondorf, who had recently allied himself with the King of Hyrule. 
Zelda didn't trust him though, and she sent Link out to get the remaining two spiritual stones in an effort to obtain the Triforce before Ganondorf. But much like the three pendants in A Link to the Past, the three spiritual stones were just the beginning of Link's adventure. While on his way to bring the stones to Zelda, the events of Link's nightmare suddenly became a reality. Impa, Zelda's nursemaid and protector, was rushing the princess out of the castle on horseback. Following her was the vile thief himself, Ganondorf. He quickly dispatched Link and continued his pursuit, but what he didn't know was that Zelda had left something behind, the Ocarina of Time. With this new item in tow, Link heads to the Temple of Time, where the three spiritual stones open up a secret door to a chamber that contains the Master Sword. Upon lifting it, though, both players and Link were in for a big surprise. It turns out the Master Sword was actually being used as a sort of key. As long as it stayed in its pedestal, the Sacred Realm would remain off-limits to anyone unworthy of the blade. But in lifting the sword, you inadvertently opened the gates and let Ganondorf in to claim the Triforce and achieve his goal of world domination. Moments later, Link wakes up in a mysterious temple. An old man named Rauru stands before him and explains that Ganondorf has in fact gained control of the Triforce and brought ruin to Hyrule. The key to stopping him was once again the Sword of Evil's Bane, the Master Sword, but when Link had originally lifted it, he was still too young to wield it. For this reason, his spirit was frozen in time for seven years while his body aged. Now an adult, Link was finally ready to fulfill his destiny and become the hero of time. Your quest was to travel across Hyrule to awaken a series of sages who could combine their power with Link's to once again seal Ganondorf away and reclaim the power of the Triforce for good. Similar to the light and dark world mechanics in A Link to the Past, players could once again travel between two interconnected worlds at will, but this time it was between the present and the future. These worlds didn't interact as directly as the ones found in A Link to the Past, but they instead came with their own unique mechanics depending on which version of Link you were controlling. Young Link could wield a slingshot and boomerang, while adult Link carried a bow and a hookshot. A Hylian shield could protect young Link like a shell, but could be worn more proportionately as an adult. And just like reaching the Dark World for the first time in A Link to the Past, this is where Ocarina of Time truly began. Different areas in Hyrule came with their own denizens with unique traits and abilities, like the rock-living Gorons, the aquatic Zoras, and Link's former forest-dwelling family, the Kokiri. These areas were all connected by a massive open space called Hyrule Field, which gave players a sense of freedom and exploration unmatched by nearly anything that had come before it, especially once Link obtained his very own steed. Where previous games saw Link travel by foot or by bird, for the first time since the Legend of Zelda cartoon, Link could now ride his very own horse to quickly traverse Hyrule's massive landscape. This all culminated in one of the most epic finales players could have possibly imagined. A final showdown with Ganondorf tasked Link with utilizing all the skills he had learned up to that point, incorporating multiple phases, an escape sequence, and a terrifying standoff with Ganondorf's beast form, Ganon. Once the battle was won, the ensuing ending left players with no shortage of unanswered questions and kicked off years of conversations regarding its meaning in relation to the rest of the franchise and the series' complicated timeline. One thing most people agreed on, though, was that it was one of the most memorable and special gaming experiences ever crafted. Nintendo had outdone themselves yet again. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was immediately heralded by fans and critics as one of the best games ever made, and it maintained that reputation for decades, arguably to this day. It once again expanded the concept of what a Zelda game could be, and created a high watermark that Nintendo would find themselves chasing after for generations. Its influence can't be overstated, and while it wasn't quite enough to close the gap between Nintendo and Sony in terms of console sales, it helped cement the Nintendo 64's legacy as a worthy competitor during its generation. Ocarina of Time also helped propel The Legend of Zelda to its highest level of mainstream popularity since its debut, winning multiple Game of the Year awards and setting franchise sales records. But 1998 wasn't quite done with The Legend of Zelda yet. The Zelda Game & Watch game was re-released as part of the Nintendo Mini Classics line. Gameplay was identical, but the unit itself was shrunk down to a gold keychain. More notably, though, was Zelda's debut on Nintendo's newest hardware revision, the Game Boy Color. 
The Game Boy was able to stave off stiff competition in the handheld market from full-color competitors like the Sega Game Gear and Atari Lynx by providing an inexpensive, battery-efficient alternative with an unmatched game library. But by 1998, the monochrome Game Boy came off as positively ancient by modern standards, so Nintendo introduced the Game Boy Color, finally bringing full-color graphics to Nintendo's handheld line. While marginally more powerful than its predecessor, at its core it was still the same old Game Boy, which made porting existing titles a relatively simple task, and Nintendo knew just which game to colorize first. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX was released in December 1998, just one month after Ocarina of Time, and simultaneously gave new Game Boy Color owners a taste of what the Zelda franchise was all about, and Ocarina of Time fans a quick and easy way to get more of the series once they had finished off their new 3D adventure. The game's opening cinematic proved to be a compelling case for the Game Boy Color, with Link's shipwreck appearing more harrowing than ever, and the colorful windfish egg a stark contrast to its black and white counterpart. Many aspects of Koholint came to life in color like never before, but there was a slight catch. Since the game's graphics had originally been drawn with a monochrome presentation in mind, they didn't exactly lend themselves to colorization as well as some would have hoped, ultimately resulting in a look that was more colored in than in color. But Link's Awakening DX was still largely identical to the already excellent Link's Awakening in terms of gameplay and story, with a few new additions added for good measure. There was a new camera shop where a mouse would take pictures of Link that players could print if they had access to a Game Boy printer. Some small cosmetic changes like stone tablets now taking the shape of owl statues, and most significant of all was a new optional color dungeon where Link could obtain either a red or blue tunic to increase his offense or defense respectively. Both of these reissues were great for their own reasons, but following the lack of games leading up to Ocarina of Time, some fans grew concerned that another long-term dearth of new entries in their favorite franchise might be in their future. Nintendo shared these concerns and got to work right away on new entries in the Zelda franchise for both of their current hardware models. In an effort to make the process easier, both of these projects relied heavily on the reusing of assets. The resulting games, though, were anything but retreads. By the close of the 1990s, the gaming landscape had changed significantly. Sega had already launched their next-generation console, the Dreamcast, in September 1999, and the PlayStation 2 was hot on its heels, preparing for launch in October 2000. Nintendo's next-generation hardware remained a mystery, though, and their outward focus continued on the now-struggling Nintendo 64. Fans knew that they were planning a direct follow-up to Ocarina of Time, and in July 2000 they finally got their first look at Link's next great adventure. But this game would unfortunately have to share its spotlight, as one month later at their annual Space World trade show in Japan, Nintendo officially unveiled the GameCube. During this presentation, they made their intentions known with a lineup of demo footage showing off Nintendo franchises with spectacular next-generation visuals. Mario, Luigi, Pokemon, and even Metroid made appearances, but one reel stood out among the rest. <laughs> These 11 seconds of footage showed off exactly what North American fans wanted out of The Legend of Zelda, and where gaming trends in the region were heading as a whole. It was dark, violent, and featured an adult Link facing down a menacing Ganondorf in one-on-one -on -one combat. It was exhilarating, and while it did its job of drumming up hype for Nintendo's next-generation hardware, it had the unfortunate side effect of casting a very long shadow over every other upcoming Zelda project. This was the game Nintendo fans had been dreaming of, but what they got instead couldn't have been more different. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was released on October 26, 2000, defiantly releasing the same day as the North American launch of the PlayStation 2, and was one of the series' most divisive entries to date. Its graphics and sound were immediately familiar to fans of Ocarina of Time, with character models and various sound effects ripped directly from Link's previous Nintendo 64 adventure. The game itself, though, was a massive departure. Following his return to childhood at the end of Ocarina of Time, Link went searching for Navi, who had seemingly left him during the game's finale. While venturing in the woods in the land of Termina, Link was accosted by a pair of fairies and a Skull Kid wearing a disturbing-looking mask. 
What at first seemed like a bit of mischievous thievery quickly escalated as in a shocking display of power the Skull Kid transformed Link into a Deku Scrub. This unsettling sequence set the stage for what is easily Link's darkest adventure yet. You soon learn that Termina is headed for ruin thanks to an enormous, horrifying moon that's hurtling toward its central location, Clocktown. It was summoned by the Skull Kid under the influence of something called Majora's Mask, a devastatingly powerful entity that fed off the Skull Kid's loneliness. Link had just three days to figure out a way to stop the moon from crashing into the town, killing everyone for miles. Thanks to the power of the Ocarina of Time, though, he could relive those same three days as many times as he needed in order to get the job done. This mechanic, as well as the game's liberal reuse of existing assets and bizarre haunted atmosphere, left fans divided. On one hand, Majora's Mask took what Ocarina of Time established in bold new directions, but on the other, its tone was radically different from everything else that came before it, to the extent of almost not feeling much like a Zelda game at all. Masks played a central role in the adventure as each one you collected granted you access to new abilities, especially the three primary transformation masks. These allowed Link to change forms to a Deku Scrub, Goron, and Zora at will, granting the player a wealth of new abilities. There was even a secret fourth transformation that would turn Link into the incredibly powerful Fierce Deity, which made the final boss encounter considerably more manageable. The new mechanics made for an interesting game, but thanks to the nature of the N64 hardware, it was also an extremely unattractive one, especially next to the likes of Sega Dreamcast's high-fidelity visuals and Nintendo's own GameCube tech demo. Muddy textures, low frame rates, intentionally garish character designs, and abrasive music were a turnoff for many fans who missed the beauty in Ocarina of Time's Hyrule. Termina was a very unpleasant place, and the game wanted you to know it. But it wasn't always that way and for anyone willing to look for it, in fact, contained a different kind of beauty all its own. In replaying the same three days over and over, players learned that the people of Termina were more alive than what any previous Zelda game had to offer, with their own routines and daily challenges. While on the surface the game seemed to be all about darkness and despair, Majora's Mask is ultimately a story about healing, one that resonated with a sect of fans so much so that many consider it to be a superior game to even Ocarina of Time. Much like Zelda 2, many of Majora's Mask's defining elements haven't been revisited by mainline entries in the series since, and its sales were less than half of what Ocarina of Time managed to accomplish. Still, the game is looked back on fondly, and while it's not the generation-defining experience its predecessor was, it remains one of the most unique adventures Nintendo has ever made. But while all eyes then turned to whatever The Legend of Zelda on GameCube would eventually turn out to be, something else was coming to Nintendo's handheld. Back in 1999, Capcom approached Nintendo about remaking the original Legend of Zelda for the Game Boy Color. Nintendo agreed, but the project eventually turned into a trio of releases based on the three pieces of the Triforce, with one being the originally proposed remake and the remaining two being developed as original titles. When it became apparent that this project was perhaps a bit too ambitious, the three became two, resulting in Link's first non-Nintendo developed adventures since the CDI. The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages was released on May 13, 2001, one month before Nintendo launched their next generation handheld, the Game Boy Advance. Like Majora's Mask, Oracle of Ages borrowed heavily from its predecessor, in this case Link's Awakening DX. From Link's sprites and animations, enemies, NPCs, music, and environments, almost every asset was lifted wholesale from the beloved colorized classic. But also like Majora's Mask, the game within was a much different experience. One day, Link is called to the Triforce, but when he arrives, he is transported to the land of Labrina, where he finds Impa in trouble. After fending off her attackers, the two of them search for a singer named Nehru. They eventually find her, but after some brief introductions, a shadow bursts from Impa. It turns out that Viren, Sorceress of Shadows, had possessed Impa in order to capture Nehru, who was secretly the Oracle of Ages, and as such has the ability to alter time itself. Viren immediately possesses Nehru and uses her abilities to change the past. Link follows her into a time portal and a new quest begins. Link must once again travel between two different time periods, this time through the use of the Harp of Ages, to obtain the Eight Essences of Time. Time travel here, though, resembles the Light World and Dark World from Link to the Past more so than the time travel found in Ocarina of Time. 
What you do in the past affects the present, this time in ways that include characters as well as their environments. Traversal of the Overworld was again relegated to screen-by-screen -screen movement, but the dungeons incorporate scrolling for uniquely shaped rooms and more complex puzzles than those found in Link's Awakening. The game introduced a ring system that works as a sort of level-up mechanic, and clever new items like the switch hook and seed shooter kept things feeling fresh. Link also had the option of riding a number of animal friends, one of which becomes a more permanent companion depending on the specific items found during the quest. Eventually, Link manages to free Nehru from Viren's grasp, but she quickly possesses the Queen instead, which ultimately leads to a final encounter with her on top of the Black Tower, a construction project that progressively gets further along throughout the course of the story. Once you defeat Viren, the past begins to return to normal, and the land of Labrina can once again be at peace. On the same day, a second Game Boy Color adventure, The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons, was released. While the game starts in a nearly identical fashion as Oracle of Ages, this time Link is transported to the land of Holodrum. Once there, he is discovered by a dancer named Din, who brings him back to her camp where her fellow traveling musicians, including Impa who serves as the group's cook, have a casual dance party over a meal. When out of nowhere, a dark being named Onox shows up to kidnap Din, who turns out to be the Oracle of Seasons. This throws the Seasons of Holodrum into a state of chaos, which is exactly what Onox wants in an effort to destroy all life. Once the chaos dies down, Impa tells Link that she was planted there by Zelda so that she could keep Din safe and escort her to Hyrule Castle. Now though, it's up to you to rescue Din and save Holodrum from destruction. In order to do this, Link will have to harness the power of the Rod of Seasons and track down the essences of nature in order to reach Onox and rescue Din. Unlike Oracle of Ages, Oracle of Seasons incorporates a number of elements from the original Legend of Zelda remake concept, such as bosses and basic dungeon designs. Aside from these aspects though, Oracle of Seasons contains a remarkable level of ingenuity and originality. Areas like the subterranean Sabrosia left a lasting impression on players, as did the magnetic gloves which allowed Link to pull himself toward or push himself away from various obstacles. It was more open-ended than Oracle of Ages, and objectives were sometimes hidden beneath obscure tasks, but the adventure was filled with exciting moments that cleverly mirrored Oracle of Ages while maintaining its own sense of identity. This all led up to a final showdown with Onox in a surprisingly difficult multi-phase battle. Once defeated, Din was freed, and peace and order were restored to Holodrum. Both Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons are entirely unique games, and each can stand on their own as relatively complete experiences. But only by completing them both could players uncover their true meaning. Before whichever game's final boss you get to first, Link is confronted by Twin Rova, the twin witches Kume and Kotake from Ocarina of Time. They tell him that his efforts will be for naught, and that the evil king will return. After completing the final boss encounter, the player is given a special password to enter before beginning their second adventure. This password informs the opposing game that you had completed the other. Upon completion of the second adventure, players are transported to a maze where Princess Zelda is being held captive. Twin Roba then informs you that they had been using Onox and Viren all along to further their plot, and sacrificing Zelda is the last step in the resurrection of Ganon. Upon her defeat, Twin Rova sacrifices her own body to bring about Ganon's return, and Link must defeat his old nemesis once more. Majora's Mask, Oracle of Ages, and Oracle of Seasons all relied heavily on the repurposing of assets from previous games, but they each managed to become their own unique adventures and have more than earned their own fandoms. While the Oracle games in particular proved to Nintendo that occasionally lending someone else the reins to The Legend of Zelda could yield spectacular results. The Legend of Zelda was in a very good place, but an undeniable pattern had emerged. Every original entry in the series released after 1998, as well as the GameCube tech demo, shared one thing in common. They all took place in worlds modeled after what was established in Ocarina of Time. The Legend of Zelda was due for a change, and once again, it was a change that no one saw coming. Video games were once again changing, and Nintendo was quickly being left behind. On the home console front, the Nintendo 64 had been struggling, especially in terms of what it had done to Nintendo's reputation. 
While the reality of their philosophy has always been that their games are for everyone, the public perception at the time had become that Nintendo games were for children. But following their Space World 2000 presentation, fans felt confident that the GameCube was going to be different, and Zelda was going to deliver on the next generation experience they had hoped for. As Space World 2001 approached, anticipation for a closer look at Zelda for GameCube had reached a fever pitch. But when Nintendo finally unveiled Link's next generation adventure, nobody could believe their eyes. The audience applauded politely, but it was clear even to the people watching from home that the energy had left the room. Nintendo had delivered what could only be described as the complete opposite of what fans had been asking for. In lieu of realistic visuals, Nintendo had incorporated cell shading, a technique which allowed games to look like living cartoons. Link was now a happy child who mischievously winked at the camera, and the Moblins exhibited Looney Tunes-style antics hovering in the air before falling to the ground. Fans weren't pleased, and the GameCube's luck started to turn before it was even released. Gaming and pop culture was trending towards dark, gritty tones. The PlayStation popularized the concept that video games were for grown-ups now, and the more blood, violence, and swear words you had, the cooler you were. This stood in stark contrast to Nintendo's general philosophy, and while not every game that appeared on the Nintendo 64 was bright and colorful, it had become what they were known for. And as a result, many fans who had grown up on their games were becoming disillusioned. Nintendo believed in their new vision for Zelda, though, and delayed the game into 2003 to make sure it was as polished as possible. In the meantime, fans were given a surprise sneak peek into this colorful new world by way of revisiting an old favorite. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past was ported to the Game Boy Advance in December 2002. This version did little to change the Super NES Classic, but some alterations were made. Voice samples were added, sprites were changed, the Seven Wise Men were now the Seven Sages, and like Link's Awakening DX, an optional dungeon was added where players encountered new puzzles and updated iterations of the game's bosses. A Link to the Past wasn't the only game on the cart, though, as Nintendo had once again partnered with Capcom to include a separate adventure called The Legend of Zelda Four Swords, and this was a whole new kind of game. Four Swords was a multiplayer-only adventure designed around two to four players working cooperatively to solve puzzles and defeat bosses. One day, Zelda sensed a weakness in the seal surrounding something called the Four Sword, which was being used to imprison a wind sorcerer named Vati. She summoned Link to investigate, but when they arrived, Vati had already escaped and upon revealing himself, kidnapped Zelda. Link now needed to use the power of the Four Sword to split himself into multiple parts to rescue the princess and seal Vati away once more. It was a short adventure, and one that very few people actually played thanks to its requirement of four Game Boy Advance systems, Link cables, and multiple copies of the game, but those that did were treated to a truly unique Zelda experience. It was the first entry released in the U.S. to utilize the Toon Link style that was about to be properly established in the next mainline entry in just a few months. While nowhere near as expressive as its counterpart would prove to be, it was clear the direction they were headed in had merit, and the bright visuals lent themselves well to the Game Boy Advance's dark screen. More importantly, the game was fun. Like many of Nintendo's arcade-style classics, completing Four Swords required players to work together, but there was a competitive aspect to the game as well. Each area you cleared brought you to a results screen where players were ranked based on how many rupees they had collected. This often led to the game becoming quite chaotic as players balanced the desire to win bragging rights against the goal of actually completing the adventure. In the end, Link sealed Vati back into the Four Sword, freed Princess Zelda, and returned peace to Hyrule. Nintendo was clearly pleased with the results, as it wouldn't be long before Capcom and the Four Sword reappeared, but while this worked well on Nintendo's indomitable handheld, the real test was coming to the GameCube. The negative reaction to Zelda's reveal had gotten worse over time. The cell-shaded visuals looked better in subsequent trailers, but the general fan outcry was clear. They wanted what Nintendo showed at Space World 2000, and this was not it. With so many fans writing the experience off as a kid's game before it even released, Nintendo had an uphill battle ahead of them, but before long, the game was complete. It was time to find out how players would react to the transition from the hero of time 
to the hero of winds. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker was released on March 24, 2003, and Nintendo went all out in trying to convince fans to try the game for themselves, regardless of how they felt about its visuals. Its ad campaign had a mysterious dark tone that downplayed the game's colorful nature, and as a pre-order bonus, they offered a GameCube port of Ocarina of Time that also included the game's previously unreleased second quest, known as Aura Zelda, now titled the Ocarina of Time Master Quest. To some, it seemed like a desperate move, but the strategy paid off, and in reminding players exactly what it was that they loved about Ocarina of Time, they managed to drum up genuine fan excitement to finally go hands-on with the game. And once it released, players quickly learned that its ties to the past were far deeper than anyone had expected. The ensuing intro consisted of a series of ancient-looking drawings which effectively told the story of what happened after Ocarina of Time. Once Ganondorf had been sealed away, Hyrule was at peace, until the great evil escaped once more and wreaked havoc on the land. The people of Hyrule waited for their champion to return, but he never did. Instead, they were forced to turn to the gods for help, and their answer was to flood the land, drowning the Hyrule that was beneath what became known as the Great Sea. These events became legends, handed down through generations, as the surviving Hylian people developed new communities on the mountaintops which had now become the islands in the Great Sea. Because of these legends, it became customary in some places to dress young boys in green when they came of age in honor of the Hero of Time, and see if adventure would call them away. One of these islands was called Outset, and it was there that a boy named Link lived with his grandmother and little sister. On Link's birthday, he and his sister caught sight of a gigantic bird who had a girl in his grasp, being pursued by a pirate ship. The ship managed to shoot the bird, which dropped the girl into the woods. Link went to investigate and learned that she was a pirate leader named Tetra. She thanked him for his help, but when they were heading home, Link's sister Errol was suddenly grabbed by the bird and taken away. After some convincing, the pirates agreed to take Link to Forsaken Fortress, where the bird had been sighted, but the rescue attempt was ultimately unsuccessful, as Link himself got caught by the bird and was quickly discarded by its master. It was then that he was rescued by a living boat named the King of Red Lions, who informed him of the identity of his attacker. His name was Ganondorf, and he had been kidnapping maidens in an effort to find Princess Zelda. Link would once again need the Master Sword to defeat him, and so began a quest to find three sacred pearls, raise the Tower of the Gods, prove his worth to wield the Master Sword, and bring his sister Errol home safe. This would require traversing the Great Sea, and in order to do so, he would have to master the use of a magical conductor's baton called the Wind Waker. With it, Link could control the direction of the wind, allowing him to sail in any direction he needed. The Great Sea was enormous, but it was also filled with life. Every square of the map contained at least one island, and every one served some sort of purpose, be it a simple heart container or an entire city teeming with unique personalities. Gameplay was very similar to Ocarina of Time, though it had been expertly refined. Locking onto targets was more intuitive than ever, and combat now included a parry system that could help Link tackle deadly foes more than twice his size. The music was gorgeous, performed with much higher fidelity instruments than the franchise had ever heard before, and what was clearly most surprising to some, The Wind Waker was undeniably beautiful. As it turned out, the visual design that the game was so maligned for was actually one of its greatest strengths, proving to be one of the most visually striking games released on any platform of its generation. Its outward appearance was fun and colorful, but this simplistic nature allowed Nintendo to focus on an unparalleled level of realism, from the way the wind affected the environments, to seamless transitions between areas, and even Link's movements themselves. Characters were among the most expressive ever seen in a video game, with special attention paid to the eyes. So much so that Link's vision could be used as a sort of built-in hint system, with the character often automatically looking at things in the environment that seemed out of place. The adventure was as deep as the ocean it was set on, and the people and places players met along the way were unforgettable. Once Link had returned the pearls and proved his worth, the King of Red Lions took him down beneath the sea, where Hyrule somehow remained untouched by the water and completely frozen in time. 
Once again, the Master Sword had served as a sort of key, but this time it was what had kept the monsters that were previously invading Hyrule at bay. Once removed, the castle returned to life, and Link put his newfound weapon to the test. After the Legion of Enemies had been defeated, it was time for Link to once again face Ganondorf. Unfortunately, not even the power of the Master Sword was enough to strike him down. Following a daring rescue and a surprising reveal of Princess Zelda's true identity, Link then had to set out to awaken a series of sages to bring the full power back to the Master Sword and find the missing pieces of the Triforce of Courage in order to stand a chance at finally putting an end to Ganondorf. This all led to an epic final battle where Link and Zelda had to team up to stop Ganondorf while the oceans surrounding them flooded Hyrule, ending in one of the most shocking finales in the series' history. Critics lauded The Wind Waker for its bold new direction, and the game was a moderate success, easily outselling Majora's Mask, but still falling well short of Ocarina of Time. Many fans still refused to get behind this colorful new iteration, but over time, The Wind Waker's reputation changed, and is now often regarded as one of the series' highest points, thanks to the added depth of its lead characters, memorable music, and of course, its breathtaking visuals. At the time, though, audiences made it abundantly clear to Nintendo that if they ever wanted Zelda to regain its former level of popularity, things would need to change once again. But that was going to take time, and as players would soon learn, there was still plenty to see in this colorful new world, and it would be seen through the Game Boy Advance. At E3 2003, Nintendo's presentation focused heavily on connectivity between the GameCube and the Game Boy Advance via a special link cable. Among the demos shown were two Zelda games, a new version of Four Swords, and a companion piece to The Wind Waker called Tetris Trackers. Later that year, a third game called Shadow Battle was added to the list, but while all three of these adventures got bundled together for a single release in Japan, only two of them made it to the West, Shadow Battle and an all-new sequel to Four Swords. The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures released in June 2004, this time developed in-house at Nintendo with no involvement from Capcom's flagship team. The game featured a unique look that blended the visual styles of both Wind Waker and A Link to the Past, and unlike the relatively small-scale adventure of the Game Boy Advance original, Four Swords Adventures was very much a fully-fledged game. Thanks to the power of the GameCube, this was the first 2D Zelda game to feature a dynamic camera, panning in and out depending on how much was happening on the screen at a time. But its biggest hook wasn't one screen, it was five. Utilizing the link cable, up to four players could connect Game Boy Advance systems to a single GameCube and use them as controllers. Each player would then have their own screen which would work in tandem with the television the GameCube was connected to. Overworld locations were displayed on the TV, while indoor locations were displayed on the Game Boy Advance. This allowed for a whole new level of competition and puzzle solving that was only possible with this specific setup, with certain players being the only ones able to see what they were doing at specific points. Following the events of the original Four Swords, Vati's seal was once again in danger of breaking, but this time Zelda and Link came prepared. They brought along with them the Shrine Maidens to help open the Four Sword Sanctuary and keep Vati at bay, but once inside, a shadow version of Link appeared and sealed the Maidens inside crystals. Link lifted the Four Sword to fight his shadowy doppelganger, but released Vati in the process. Link now had to once again travel across Hyrule to rescue the Maidens, including Zelda, and defeat the Wind Sorcerer once and for all. Vati wasn't the one responsible for Shadow Link, though. The true villain was Ganon who had orchestrated the plot to release Vati as a distraction. Through the use of teamwork, though, Link was able to defeat his nemesis once again and return the Four Sword to its resting place. Unlike the original Four Swords, Four Swords Adventures could be played by a single person by allowing the four Links to move together in various formations, but the only way to properly experience the game was with four players. Every facet of the adventure was crafted with multiplayer in mind, including some truly devious puzzles. Instead of rupees, this time the Links collected Force Gems, which were hidden everywhere, and the player with the most gems at the end of a stage would be declared the winner. Infighting could cause players to drop their gems, but this too had consequences. At the end of each stage, players were prompted to vote on who helped or hindered the most, which would affect the overall Force Gem totals. Competition could get fierce, but just like before, the only way forward was through cooperation, making Four Swords Adventures one of the most unique and fun party game experiences on the GameCube.
However, thanks to the demanding physical requirements of a GameCube, a copy of the game, four Game Boy Advance consoles, and four Game Boy Advance link cables, Four Swords Adventures failed to catch on, and remains to this day the lowest selling Zelda game ever, with the exception of the CDI releases. It reviewed extremely well though, and has built up quite a cult following in the years since its release, thanks to its unique presentation and unusual gameplay. But while Nintendo was working on this, Capcom had one final Zelda game in the works, and it would be Link's smallest adventure yet. The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap released on January 10, 2005, and acts as a culmination of everything Capcom had done with the series to this point. Built on the basic foundation of Four Swords and serving as that game's prequel, The Minish Cap once again utilized the art direction established in Wind Waker to great effect. But where that game was set on a massive scale, Minish Cap took things in the opposite direction and allowed players to experience Hyrule from the perspective of its tiniest denizens. Long ago, a race of miniature beings called the Pickery, or Minish, worked together with the Hylian people to extinguish a great evil. They crafted a sword for the hero of men, who with its power was able to drive evil from the land. This blade was known as the Pickery Sword, which was sealed away for safekeeping. However, once a year, Hyrule held a festival to celebrate the Pickery, during which one person would be allowed to touch the blade. On the 100th anniversary of the festival, a sorcerer came to try his hand at wielding it. That sorcerer's name was Vati. Convinced that this sword was the key to unlocking unimaginable power, he took the blade only to realize that the power he was after wasn't there. In his rage, he destroyed the sword and turned Princess Zelda to stone. Link then set out to the Minish Woods to find the Pickery so they could reforge the blade, but on his way he encountered a strange being who had been attacked by monsters. Link saved the creature who then climbed onto his head to be worn like a hat. Its name was Ezlo, and he used to be a Minish sage, and Vati was once his apprentice. He then informed Link that if he was going to see the Pickery, he was going to have to shrink down to their size. Effectively an extension of the Nat Hat ability introduced in Four Swords, the Minish Cap's central gimmick revolved around Link's ability to change sizes to experience the world from different perspectives. Capcom once again showed off their creativity with an incredible world, intricate dungeon designs, and innovative new items. The Cane of Pachi could flip over enemies and items in an instant, as well as be used to launch Link to new heights. The Mole Mitts allowed Link to burrow through the ground and access new areas and treasures. Rock's Cape from Oracle of Seasons returned to grant Link the ability to glide across chasms. And the Gust Jar gave you the ability to control gusts of wind, something that ultimately served a multitude of purposes. After recovering the four elements, the Pickery Blade was reforged into the Four Sword. But in the time it took Link to accomplish this, Vati had discovered that the power he was after resided in Zelda all along and he had already begun extracting it from her. Link confronts the sorcerer, and with the help of Zelda is able to seal Vati away, return Ezlo to his original form, and bring peace back to Hyrule. The Minish Cap was a magnificent celebration of Capcom's unique take on The Legend of Zelda, and it resonated with fans and critics alike. It may have been shorter than many of Link's previous adventures, but its colorful world left a lasting impression, and it's commonly listed among fan favorites today. Unfortunately, it's also one of the least played games in the series, with some of the lowest sales numbers in franchise history. These vibrant adventures may not have been what many fans wanted, but they were clearly the games that Nintendo wanted to make, and that passion came through in each and every one. But the winds of change were once again in the air, and Nintendo was about to do something that for them was unheard of. Give fans exactly what they wanted. As the battle between the PlayStation 2, Xbox, and GameCube raged on, Nintendo's platform was once again falling behind. Even with titles like Eternal Darkness and the Resident Evil Remake, Nintendo couldn't shake their four kids' image. Third-party support was better than it was during the Nintendo 64 era, but thanks to the GameCube's proprietary mini-disc format, it still lagged far behind the competition in terms of both quantity and quality. As for The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker reviewed well, but fans had still not gotten over the more realistic tech demo from Space World 2000. Mainstream gaming tastes in the US remained all about grit and realism, and no amount of quality Nintendo could muster was going to change that. But Nintendo had a plan, and they unveiled it to the world at E3 2004. 
Future CEO and President of Nintendo of America, Reggie fils made his on-stage debut and immediately followed his opening statement with an onslaught of trailers that aimed to back up their slogan for the year, We Make Games That Make Games Worth Playing. Metroid Prime 2 and Star Fox Assault kicked off the presentation, which led into the jaw-dropping showstopper that was the GameCube exclusive Resident Evil 4. Advance Wars, Pokemon, Paper Mario, Pikmin, F-Zero, Nintendo had something for everyone, but that wasn't all. Beyond a brazen confidence in their sales data and aggressive new marketing plans, as well as the promise of being able to play these new titles on the show floor once their presentation concluded, Nintendo also unveiled their new touchscreen handheld device, the Nintendo DS. This was Nintendo firing on all cylinders, and both fans and the gaming press couldn't help but be blown away by the massive turnaround in quality content. But not even Nintendo themselves could have predicted the reaction to what they were about to do. Reggie took the stage once more and made history. I hope you've all enjoyed our program this morning. But before you leave, I'd like you to step inside one more world for Nintendo GameCube. Applause was deafening as series creator Shigeru Miyamoto took to the stage with Master Sword in hand to explain that it was finally time for Link to grow up. It was one of the most exciting moments in the history of the Electronic Entertainment Expo, and Nintendo fans couldn't have been happier. Unfortunately, the excitement didn't last. Metroid Prime 2 had the misfortune of launching against Microsoft's unstoppable juggernaut Halo 2. Star Fox Assault disappointed fans and critics alike. Resident Evil 4 was no longer a GameCube exclusive, and The Legend of Zelda would be delayed for another two years. The GameCube was ultimately unable to regain ground in North America, and while by no means an abject failure, it simply couldn't compete with Microsoft and Sony on their terms. If Nintendo was going to be successful in the home console market, they would need to change the game yet again. It was time for a revolution. The Nintendo DS had quickly become a surprising success. Its unconventional display and touchscreen were exciting for players and developers alike, and helped Nintendo reach a new expanded audience like never before. Casual gamers were flocking to the DS, and Nintendo wanted to bring that excitement to their home console line with the GameCube's successor, the Nintendo Revolution. Its initial reveal at E3 2005 was cryptic, especially in terms of what would eventually make the system every bit the revolution its name promised. A few months later, at the 2005 Tokyo Game Show, Nintendo unveiled their new console's secret weapon, its revolutionary new controller concept, and players finally began to wrap their heads around what Nintendo had officially dubbed Wii. Its unique controller would bring motion gaming to the masses, and Nintendo ensured its success with games that would appeal to everyone. For the casual market, the system came packed in with Wii Sports, a game that would go on to become a bona fide global phenomenon. For the core gamers, they had The Legend of Zelda, which would now serve as both the premier launch title for the Wii and the swan song for the Nintendo GameCube. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess released alongside the Nintendo Wii on November 19, 2006, and now fully incorporated motion controls. Players would have to swing the Wii Remote to make Link use his sword, and other items like the boomerang and arrows would be aimed using the IR sensor. 
In an effort to make this feel more natural, Nintendo decided to make Link right-handed like the majority of the population. But rather than recode the entire game, they simply reversed it, making the Wii game a literal mirror image of its original GameCube incarnation. It featured a more muted color palette than any previous Zelda game, with realistic art direction to match, and at no point were players tasked with controlling Link as a child. This time around, Link was a farmhand in Ordon Village. One day, monsters attacked and kidnapped the local children. Link attempted to rescue them, but ran into an ominous dark veil looming over the area. A hand reached out and pulled him in, where he was somehow transformed into a wolf, captured, and imprisoned. While locked away, Link came in contact with a mysterious creature named Midna, who freed him in exchange for his service. The two made their way to the top of Hyrule Castle where they met Princess Zelda, who informed Link that a sorcerer named Zant had invaded Hyrule and taken the castle by force. He hailed from an alternate dimension called the Twilight Realm, where he had usurped the former ruler and crowned himself king. Much like the Dark World from A Link to the Past, the Twilight Realm functioned as a secondary map that Link couldn't traverse as his original self without the use of a special item. In lieu of the Moon Pearl, this time Link would need to find the Master Sword to retain his form, in addition to a series of relics called Fused Shadows that Midna required to gain enough power to destroy Zant. Once the Master Sword was obtained, players gained the ability to transform to and from Link's wolf form at will, an ability that was indispensable in traversing this new massive Hyrule. The map was one of the largest the Zelda series had ever seen, but there was a catch. For as much real estate as the game boasted, most of it was barren. Unlike previous Zelda games, Twilight Princess was created as a direct response to what fans claimed they wanted. As a result, the game often seemed at odds with itself, and was criticized for feeling uninspired. There were enormous open areas suited for horseback battles, but once cleared, they left large portions of the map devoid of any meaningful content. The Wii's motion controls for aiming were a welcome change, but swinging the Wii Remote didn't actually correlate to how Link swung his sword, effectively merely replacing a button press with a non-specific gesture. Clever items like the spinner had very few uses outside the dungeons they were specifically created for, and character models were often grotesque, with exaggerated designs clashing with the realistic aesthetic. Players may have been excited about the idea of a realistic Zelda game, but that realism here conflicted with the very personality that made Zelda what it was. The result was a game that at the time of its release was well-liked enough, but for many was also slightly underwhelming. At its core, it still retained the same basic concepts introduced in Ocarina of Time, and while it managed to bring forth its own ideas and new takes on existing items, the formula was starting to grow stale, even in terms of story. Like Vati and Aghanim before him, Zant was merely a pawn for Ganondorf all along, who once again had ambitions of obtaining the Triforce to rule Hyrule. This inevitably led to a multi-phased battle with a possessed Zelda, Ganon's enormous beast form, a fast-paced pursuit on horseback, and after six years of waiting, a one-on-one -on -one sword fight with Ganondorf, finally making good on the promise of that fabled tech demo. In the end, Ganondorf was defeated and Hyrule was freed. As for the Twilight Princess, that turned out to be Midna, who was able to return to her true form before saying goodbye to Link and Zelda forever, sealing the Twilight Realm off from Hyrule once and for all. Thanks in large part to its position as a Wii launch title, Twilight Princess was a huge success, quickly outperforming even Ocarina of Time in terms of sales. Though some of its elements were becoming outdated, the game still resonated with certain fans thanks in no small part to its surprisingly quirky personality. The world may have been mostly empty, but it still contained some breathtaking environments. The action set pieces were extremely memorable, and then there was Midna, who proved to be one of the most fascinating and likable characters the franchise had ever seen. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess released on the Nintendo GameCube one month later in December 2006, and while it lacked the motion aiming and widescreen presentation of its Wii counterpart, many players considered it the superior version thanks to its more traditional control scheme, less cluttered user interface, and of course, Link's left-handed fighting stance. For better or worse, Twilight Princess was finally done. Nintendo had given fans the game they wanted, and as usual, the question quickly became, what's next? And once again, the answer was completely unexpected. 
The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass released on the Nintendo DS in October 2007 and surprisingly served as a direct follow-up not to Twilight Princess, but to The Wind Waker. Taking place shortly after that game's finale, Link and Tetra set out to explore the ocean. While at sea, the crew encountered a ghost ship that had been rumored to be terrorizing the seas. Tetra jumped on board to investigate, but quickly disappeared from sight and was heard screaming as the ship pulled away. Link tried to jump on board to rescue her, but was unable to maintain his grip and fell into the sea. He washed up on an unfamiliar island where he was greeted by a fairy named Celia, who brought him to meet an old man named Oceus. Oceus told Link that he should enlist the help of a boat captain named Linebeck in order to locate the ghost ship and save Tetra. They eventually found him in the Temple of the Ocean King, where he had gotten himself trapped. Once Link and Celia helped him out, grabbed a nearby sea chart, and explained their situation, Linebeck reluctantly offered his assistance, as long as he got to keep whatever treasure the ghost ship held inside. They then set out to find the spirits of courage, wisdom, and power. Once obtained, they returned to Oceus, and the group tracked down the ghost ship only to find that Tetra had been turned to stone by an evil entity known as Bellum, who resided at the bottom of the Temple of the Ocean King. Once again, players needed to explore the Great Sea, only this time they would have to do it with the use of a touchscreen. Every one of Link's actions, from fighting enemies to even walking around, were performed via touch controls, a system that was divisive among fans, but worked surprisingly well. Everything from controlling your boomerang's trajectory to taking notes to help solve puzzles could be done without the use of a single button, making Phantom Hourglass the most accessible Zelda adventure released to date, while also improving on a few of the complaints fans had about the Wind Waker. The ocean was less vast, but it took less time to travel between locations with more interactivity while sailing. Your ship could be upgraded in ways that improved both its cosmetics and usefulness in certain situations, and while ample amounts of rupees were still occasionally required, your default wallet could hold considerably more money, meaning far fewer treasures would need to be left behind. These innovations were unfortunately counterbalanced by several major issues. The Wind Waker's visual style wasn't nearly as effective on the DS, relegating its colorful, expressive world to one that felt considerably less alive. The game's score largely consisted of short loops that would repeat ad nauseum, but the biggest issue of all revolved around the titular Phantom Hourglass. Throughout the course of the adventure, Link has to repeatedly return to the Temple of the Ocean King, with each visit bringing him closer to the final encounter with Bellum. The temple worked on a time limit, but every time you returned with more sand in the hourglass, your progress was reset, meaning that by the end of the game, players would have to repeat the same dungeon over and over, a process many considered tedious. Link eventually made his way to Bellum's lair, but after defeating him and lifting the curse on Tetra, the creature survived and used the ghost ship to attack Linebeck's boat. Following a fierce cannon battle and Bellum's temporary possession of Linebeck, the sands from the Phantom Hourglass were returned to the Great Sea, and Link and Tetra found themselves back on their ship to continue their expedition. While most wouldn't consider Phantom Hourglass a truly worthy successor to the Wind Waker, it was still a fascinating and welcome return to that world. It simultaneously played strikingly familiar, yet radically different from any previous entry in the series, and was a tremendous success. But Nintendo wasn't done experimenting with unconventional control styles for The Legend of Zelda, and one month later placed Link in the most unlikely scenario, a shooting game. Link's Crossbow Training released for the Wii in November 2007 as a pack-in for the new Wii Zapper peripheral. Containing no electronics at all, the Zapper was merely a plastic shell that held the Wii Remote and Nunchuck in a two-handed gun format, designed to make shooting games feel more natural. Defying all logic and reason, it was decided that a Zelda game be made to showcase the Zapper's capabilities, and the results were interesting to say the least. Functioning as an expanded shooting gallery, players would move a cursor around the screen to shoot targets that appeared in various locations based on the world of Twilight Princess. Some stages then pulled the camera back to function as a third-person shooter, where the player would move Link manually with the Wii Nunchuck controller and shoot enemies with the Wii Remote. Critics were undeniably amused by how fun it was to play, but many felt the zapper itself actually made the experience harder to control, opting to play the game without the peripheral altogether. It was also an incredibly shallow experience, offering at most a few hours of gameplay. 
There was no story to speak of, nor any explanation of how Link came in possession of this fully automatic crossbow, and following a final battle against a fossil Stal Lord, the game simply brings you back to the main menu. No ending, no credits, nothing. Link's crossbow training remains one of the most unusual Zelda games released in North America, but elsewhere in the world, things had gotten even stranger. Prior to the release of Twilight Princess, the first in a series of four Zelda spin-offs released overseas for the Nintendo DS, with the final game launching in August 2009. Instead of starring Link or Zelda, the main protagonist was none other than Tingle, and each game was incredibly bizarre. Here in the US, though, the Zelda franchise had once again grown disturbingly quiet, and stayed that way for nearly two years. At E3 2009, Nintendo finally confirmed that a new Zelda game was being developed from the ground up for the Wii, and it would deliver the one-to-one -one sword fighting mechanics that Twilight Princess was missing, thanks to the new Wii Motion Plus accessory. But since the game was still early in development, all that was shown was a single piece of concept art. A few months prior, though, Nintendo had announced that there was another Zelda coming to the DS, where Link would be utilizing a very different mode of transportation. The Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks released on the Nintendo DS in December 2009 and built directly on what was established in Phantom Hourglass. The game takes place in New Hyrule, which Link and Tetra discovered at the end of their expedition. Now over a hundred years later, New Hyrule is a bustling society, as well as home to the series' first mass transit system. The Spirit Tracks and their central station, the Spirit Tower, weren't just for transportation though. It turns out they also serve as a prison for a demon king named Maladus, who long ago was at war with the ancient spirits. Upon graduating from engineering school, a young boy named Link was summoned to the castle by Princess Zelda to help her sneak out and investigate stories of the Spirit Tracks vanishing. On their journey, the tracks they were riding on disappeared, and New Hyrule's Chancellor, Cole, revealed himself to be a demon with ambitions of freeing Maladus. Along with a warrior named Burn, Cole destroyed the Spirit Tower, and separated Zelda's spirit from her body to steal for use as a vessel for Maladus' return. As a spirit, nobody could see Zelda, except for Link. So the two of them set out together to put a stop to Cole's plans, and return the Spirit Tower, and by extension the Spirit Tracks, to normal. For the first time, Link and Zelda now had to work side by side for the entire adventure. Link had his usual repertoire of attacks and items, but Zelda had the newfound ability to possess mystical guards called phantoms. This allowed her to help in both combat and puzzle situations throughout the game. Exploring New Hyrule was a vastly different experience from the Great Sea since Link was relegated to traveling exclusively via the spirit tracks. There were still numerous places to go, and Traversal itself was more active and engaging than ever, thanks to having to follow the rules and regulations of the established rail system, but the sense of exploration was diminished greatly by the overworld becoming quite literally an on-rails experience. Many aspects of Phantom Hourglass were improved though, including more expressive characters, more varied music, and a less tedious central dungeon. Eventually, Link and Zelda would face off against Cole on the back of a demonic train, where Maladus had successfully possessed Zelda's body. Once defeated, Zelda was still unable to re-inhabit herself. With some help from a surprise ally, though, she eventually succeeded, but it came at a cost. With no other options available to him, Maladus devoured Cole, but the two were incompatible and Maladus began to die. With what little time he had left, he decided to try and inflict as much damage on the world as he could, leaving Link and Zelda to team up once more to destroy the beast for good. Spirit Tracks was lauded for its improvements over Phantom Hourglass, but for all its critical acclaim, its sales fell well short of its predecessor. Following its release, the series would enter yet another drought period without a single new installment or news for almost two years. But if Zelda fans had learned one thing, it was patience, and as luck would have it, Nintendo had some very ambitious designs in store. Just as Nintendo had hoped, the Wii was in fact a revolution. The motion controller and Wii Sports skyrocketed the platform to a level of home console success Nintendo hadn't seen in ages, and even their illustrious competition wanted to get in on the action with their own attempts at motion-controlled gaming. As predicted, the video game landscape had once again changed, but The Legend of Zelda had not, a problem that Nintendo was keenly aware of. With every release since Ocarina of Time, a common sentiment had been slowly growing. 
the Zelda formula was in danger of growing stale. While the games were consistently well received, it was becoming clear that they had taken the Ocarina formula as far as it could go. Zelda needed to evolve into something that felt like a modern game, while also maintaining what fans loved about the series in the first place. It was time for some experiments. At E3 2011, Nintendo officially unveiled their next generation home console, the Wii U. In order to display the system's capabilities, Nintendo put together a tech demo based on The Legend of Zelda called the Zelda HD Experience. Featuring a visual style that seemed like a cross between Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess, this interactive video sequence didn't allow players to control the action directly, but instead the environment around it. Link enters a temple and is ambushed by an enormous spider creature. During the action, players could press various virtual buttons on the Wii U gamepad to change the game's lighting from night to day and seamlessly switch the action from the television to the gamepad. It was an impressive demo, and though Nintendo was very clear about it not being footage from an actual game in development, it still got people's attention and showed off the promise of what a Zelda game on Wii U could look like. But Zelda for Wii U was still a very long way off, and Nintendo had some pressing concerns to attend to elsewhere. Their latest handheld, the Nintendo 3DS, had gotten off to a rocky start. As a follow-up to one of their most successful platforms, the Nintendo DS, it seemed like the 3DS would be a sure thing, but fans weren't buying it. Its launch library was less than inspiring, and many felt the price tag was far too high for a handheld device. The system's use of glasses-free 3D was impressive, but that alone wasn't enough. Three months after its release, Nintendo finally gave the platform its first killer app by revisiting an old favorite. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D released in June 2011 and was more than a simple port. While not a completely comprehensive remake, Ocarina of Time 3D managed to give the Nintendo 64 Classic a complete visual overhaul while staying remarkably close to the source material. Environments that used to be composed of static images were now rendered in full 3D. Character models were replaced with considerably more detailed ones. Environments featured much higher resolution textures, and animation was smoother than ever before. The sound, however, was untouched, meaning that all the Nintendo 64 music and effects remained intact. There were no structural changes to the main quest, but some subtle adjustments can be seen throughout, especially in the often maligned Water Temple, where visual indicators were added to help with managing the water levels, and the iron boots were changed to an equipable item that could be taken on and off with the press of a button. Unsurprisingly, Ocarina of Time 3D was a welcome addition to the 3DS library, and while many thought it didn't go far enough in remaking the original, what it did do was still impressive. It wasn't enough to turn the 3DS's fortunes around, a feat that would eventually be accomplished by the release of key Mario titles and a massive price cut, but it was a start, and remains arguably the best iteration of the game to date. But that wasn't the only Zelda remake handheld players would get that year, and a few months later, Nintendo delivered an unexpected surprise. The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Anniversary Edition released in September 2011 as a free download for both the DSi and Nintendo 3DS to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Legend of Zelda series. This was a full remaster of the original Four Swords for Game Boy Advance and included a number of enhancements. First and foremost was a single player option. While multiplayer was still the way the game was intended to be played, the option to go through the adventure solo was a welcome one. Taking a cue from Four Swords Adventures, a single player could control two links at once and swap back and forth to solve puzzles. It wasn't a perfect way to play, but it did allow those who didn't have the ability to coordinate with multiple other people to see what the game had to offer. In addition, it also featured a slight audio and visual makeover, wireless local multiplayer, and a set of new stages called Realm of Memories. These areas were based directly on Link's Awakening for Game Boy, A Link to the Past for Super NES, and the original Legend of Zelda for NES, and cleverly mashed up their visual styles to great effect. 2011 had already been a very busy year for Zelda fans, but there was still something missing, the Zelda game for the Wii that Nintendo announced way back in 2009. Following some lengthy delays and a public showing at E3 riddled with technical issues, the highly anticipated game was finally complete, and Nintendo capped off Zelda's 25th anniversary celebration by releasing one of their most ambitious adventures yet. 
The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword released in November 2011 for the Wii with the aim of being the ultimate in motion-controlled adventure gaming. In fact, many of Nintendo's most high-profile Wii releases to this point were in some ways testing grounds for Skyward Sword, specifically the massively successful follow-up to Wii Sports, Wii Sports Resort. Sword fighting, archery, and even bowling were incorporated into the game in an effort to deliver the most immersive Zelda experience possible, and when it worked, it worked extremely well. As the name suggests, Skyward Sword's primary mechanics center around Link's sword. Most enemies in the game required that they be hit from specific angles in order to do damage, meaning that the player would have to swing their Wii Remote in that direction to defeat them. This was a remarkably engaging form of combat, though it could become quite tedious as the game went on thanks to it often requiring patience on the player's part, waiting for the right opportunity to strike. But the sword wasn't just there for combat, it was also at the center of the game's story, which takes place at the earliest point in the series timeline. A long time ago, people lived in the sky on a collection of floating islands, with little to no knowledge of the land down below thanks to a thick, magical cloud barrier. On one of these islands, there was a town called Skyloft, which was home to a knight's academy. A student named Link was set to graduate to full knighthood at the upcoming wing ceremony, which would be performed by his childhood friend, Zelda. After overcoming some trials against a local bully named Groose, Zelda finally bestowed Link with a ceremonial sailcloth, and the two of them celebrated by taking a ride around the island on their loft wings, giant birds who share a mystical connection to the citizens of Skyloft. While in flight, a mysterious storm suddenly opened up and pulled Zelda in, knocking Link out in the process. He awoke back in Skyloft safely, but Zelda was nowhere to be found. After speaking to the headmaster, Link encountered a mysterious spirit who led him back to the goddess statue used in the wing ceremony. Once there, she opened up a secret chamber underneath the statue where a sword waited in a pedestal. This was the goddess sword, and the mysterious figure that led Link there was the sword spirit, Fee. She assured Link that Zelda was still in fact alive, and on a very important path of her own. To fulfill his part in these events, he would need to take up the sword and search for her beneath the clouds. The adventure that followed aimed to combine elements from Link's previous adventures to create the ultimate expression of what Nintendo had established in Ocarina of Time. The visual style was a cross between Twilight Princess's realistic proportions and the Wind Waker's animated approach. The result was a striking, almost watercolor look that was well suited to the Wii's graphical limitations. Like the Great Sea in the Wind Waker, the sky was a massive expanse full of islands to visit, while the land below was teeming with unusual life and large open locales like in Twilight Princess. The dungeons themselves were some of the most clever in the series, complete with some incredibly memorable bosses, including recurring battles with a villain named Girahim. He was the one responsible for the storm that took Zelda, but before he could capture her, she was saved by a servant of the goddess named Impa. Girahim's goal was to capture Zelda and use her spirit to resurrect his master, the Demon King Demise. Link, with the help of Fee, must set out to find Zelda and stop Girahim at any cost. The story of Skyward Sword was a much more personal one than nearly any entry in the series thus far. Zelda was not a princess, but a childhood friend of Link's, and the two clearly had strong feelings for one another. Fee, Groose, Impa, and Girihim all proved to be well-rounded and interesting characters in their own ways, and combined with the striking visual style and gorgeous musical score, brought a level of emotion to the game that surprised and delighted fans. However, some rather significant issues managed to plague the experience. The sky's islands were plentiful, but most of them served no purpose and contained no items or characters to talk to. The motion controls didn't work in certain environments, rendering the game nearly unplayable for many. A repeating boss battle with a strange-looking monster called the Imprisoned frequently brought the game's pace screeching to a halt, and while the world of the surface beneath the clouds was interesting, each one had to be repeated in a slightly altered form before the end of the game. These issues led to Skyward Sword's mixed reception, with most media outlets praising the game, but many fans expressing disappointment. Still, it provided players with some of the series' most fascinating lore, including the origins of the Master Sword and the eternal connection between Link, Zelda, and Ganondorf, the eventual reincarnation and physical embodiment of the hatred within the Demon King demise. While not immediately obvious at the time, Skyward Sword's legacy within The Legend of Zelda is a significant one. 
It secretly served as the first test in figuring out how to properly reinvent the series, and introduced several important mechanics that would become integral to future installments. It wasn't perfect, but it quickly became a fan favorite thanks in large part to its emotional storyline, memorable characters, and excellent soundtrack. It was not, however, the success Nintendo had hoped, with sales falling well below expectations. Still, the experiment was ultimately a success in that it provided Nintendo with the information they were looking for. Work on the next Zelda game began immediately after the release of Skyward Sword, but there were still more experiments to be done, and while they worked on their next test, they gave fans something they never thought they'd get. Clarity. The stories of each Zelda game were typically explained quite well, but one thing had constantly remained a mystery. How, or if, any of these stories fit together. Many fan theories existed and were discussed in online forums and school playgrounds for years, but Nintendo rarely commented on the existence of an official timeline. That all changed in January 2013 when Nintendo and Dark Horse Publishing released a book called The Legend of Zelda Hyrule Historia. This massive hardcover was an all-encompassing history of every official story in The Legend of Zelda series. Artwork, history, character profiles, and interviews filled its pages with more information than longtime fans ever thought they'd get from an official source. Above all else, the book contained Nintendo's official timeline for the Zelda series, or rather, timelines. According to Hyrule Historia, the stories told in The Legend of Zelda connect through not one, but three separate timelines. These include the stories found in the games themselves, as well as events that have yet to be depicted. They all start with Skyward Sword as the earliest in the series, followed by the Minish Cap, Four Swords, and Ocarina of Time, which is where the timeline splits in two. One path follows what happens when Link succeeds in defeating Ganon, and the other if he fails. Link's defeat in Ocarina of Time leads to the imprisoning war described in the Link to the Past instruction manual, which naturally then leads to a Link to the Past itself. That's followed up by Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons, Link's Awakening, the tragedy of Princess Zelda I as depicted in the Zelda II instruction manual, The Legend of Zelda, and Zelda II The Adventure of Link. The Hero is Triumphant timeline is itself then further split into two of its own timelines, one that follows Link as a child once he has returned to his own time after defeating Ganon, and the one where adult Link no longer exists since he was sent back into the past. The Child timeline starts with Majora's Mask, followed by the execution of Ganondorf by the royal family. Next comes Twilight Princess, followed by Four Swords Adventures. The final timeline, where the adult Link from Ocarina of Time no longer exists, begins with the events shown in the intro of The Wind Waker, followed naturally by The Wind Waker itself, Phantom Hourglass, and Spirit Tracks. All other releases and stories were not considered official canon. This information was both fascinating and confusing for fans. Many felt that the split timeline following Ocarina of Time made sense, but an entirely different timeline based on Link's failure at the end of Ocarina felt contradictory. However, the timeline came with a disclaimer. This chronicle merely collects information that is believed to be true at this time, and there are many obscured and unanswered secrets that still lie within the tale. As the stories and storytellers of Hyrule change, so too does its history. Hyrule history is a continuously woven tapestry of events. Changes that seem inconsequential, disregarded without even a shrug, could evolve at some point to hatch new legends and, perhaps, change this tapestry of history itself. With this paragraph, Nintendo effectively gave themselves a free pass from scrutiny. While the Legend of Zelda timeline was a fascinating topic, it was not something to be taken seriously, as it could change completely at a moment's notice. Still, the book was a massive success, and was eventually followed up by two complementary releases in the coming years, The Legend of Zelda Art and Artifacts, and The Legend of Zelda Encyclopedia. What wasn't performing so well was the Wii U. Following a lackluster launch, the system continuously struggled to find an audience. However, in their January 2013 Nintendo Direct presentation, series producer Eiji Aonuma laid out the basics of Nintendo's plans for Zelda on Wii U. According to Aonuma, the mission was to, quote, rethink the conventions of Zelda. Here, he confirmed to audiences that Skyward Sword was in fact something of an experiment in service of this new mission statement, and that the franchise's linearity was also something they were looking closely at changing. He then mentioned the Zelda HD experience they showed off at E3 2011, which was in fact used as part of the new Zelda game's development, and that it was a test for art direction. 
Following that presentation, they continued experimenting with converting previous Zelda styles into HD to find a look that suited their next adventure. But when they came to the Wind Waker, the results were particularly impressive. So since this new reinvention of Zelda was still a long way off, they decided to dedicate a portion of their resources to bringing the now decade-old classic in full to a whole new audience. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD released in October 2013, bringing what was widely regarded as one of the series' most beautiful releases to high definition for the first time. And unlike its controversial release on GameCube 10 years prior, was welcomed by fans with open arms. Applying a number of lighting changes and high-resolution textures brought the Wind Waker's world to life like never before, and while it arguably lost some of the visual charm that made the original stand out, what it offered in its place was equally attractive, just in a slightly different way. The bulk of the game remained unchanged, but feedback from its initial release was taken into account. A new item called the Swift Sail could be obtained that allowed Link to travel the sea without having to manually change the direction of the wind. Inventory management and the sea chart were moved to the gamepad screen for ease of use, and the dreaded Triforce quest that led to the game's finale was significantly streamlined. Given the Wii U's relatively small user base, sales for the Wind Waker HD were unsurprisingly low, but those who did purchase the game were treated to a modern iteration of a fan favorite without all of the negative stigma that surrounded the original version's release. Revisiting old worlds was a great way to keep fans happy while they waited for news on whatever Nintendo's big series reinvention was going to be. So much so that one month later, they did it again, but in a very different way. The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds released in November 2013 and takes place in the same world as A Link to the Past. Set an undisclosed number of years following the events of the Super NES Classic, a young blacksmith's apprentice named Link sets out to deliver a sword to Hyrule Castle. While searching the nearby sanctuary for the soldier who the sword belonged to, Link witnessed a sorcerer named Yuga transforming the priest's daughter, Ceres, into a painting. Link tried to stop Yuga, but was quickly tossed aside. He woke back up in his house where he was surprised to find a traveling merchant named Ravio next to him. He told Link he must inform Princess Zelda of Yuga's attack, but also awkwardly asked if he could be allowed to stay in his house while Link was out adventuring. In return for a place to stay, he gave Link a magical bracelet. Once at Hyrule Castle, Zelda gave Link the Pendant of Courage for safekeeping and sent him to find the Kakariko Village Elder, who then sent him to find a student of his named Osvala to warn him that Yuga might be coming for him next, since like Ceres, he was also a descendant of the Seven Sages of the Imprisoning War. Sure enough, Yuga tracked Osfala down and turned him into a painting as well. Link faced Yuga once more, but in the process was himself turned into a painting. Thankfully, Ravio's bracelet was able to not only free Link from the curse, but allowed him to transform back and forth at will. Yuga's next step was to cast a barrier around Hyrule Castle, trapping Zelda inside. Link then needed to find the remaining two pendants so he could lift the Master Sword, destroy Yuga's barrier, and rescue the princess. But just like in A Link to the Past, this was only the beginning. During his confrontation, Yuga managed to escape through a crack in the wall. Link followed and emerged on the other side in a familiar-looking locale. It looked like the Dark World from A Link to the Past, but was in fact a parallel dimension called Low Rule. Yuga's plan was to use his newfound paintings to revive Ganon. Once summoned, he merged with the beast in a bid to control the Triforce of Power. Yuga then turned to Link, but was stopped by Lowrul's princess Hilda, who transported Link to safety, told him to find the paintings, free their prisoners, and utilize their power to stop Yuga. Though the overworld maps for both Hyrule and Lowrul were effectively the same as their 16-bit counterparts, the dungeons were completely redesigned to feature a new focus on verticality, a feature that used the 3DS's screen to great effect but the biggest difference actually came in the game's structure. Thanks to Ravio having set up an item rental shop in Link's house, dungeons could be tackled in whatever order the player chose. This non-linear style broke with series tradition and lent a newfound sense of freedom to this familiar world. In the end, Princess Hilda turned out to be the true force behind Yuga in an attempt to steal Hyrule's Triforce to bring prosperity back to Low Rule. This plan backfired when Yuga betrayed her, but thanks to a surprising display of courage from Ravio, whose secret identity was finally revealed, Hilda was convinced that what she was doing was wrong, and helped return Link, Zelda, and the Triforce to their own world. 
A Link Between Worlds was well liked by both fans and critics. It was criticized for its overly simplistic art direction, but the clever puzzle designs, interesting story, memorable new characters, and fantastic musical score more than made up for it, and ultimately proved to be a worthy successor to one of the series' most celebrated entries. Both Skyward Sword and A Link Between Worlds stood as unique games on their own, but they each featured changes to the Zelda formula that would become the cornerstones of Nintendo's new concept for the franchise. Skyward Sword tested more realistic physical limitations set against the ability to traverse massive landscapes via the sky, while A Link Between Worlds tested a new, non-linear format in a familiar setting. The lessons learned from these two games would be applied directly to Zelda for Wii U, which had quickly become a massive undertaking and one of Nintendo's most ambitious projects in the company's history. But with the Wii U console itself failing to reach mainstream success, Nintendo was faced with a daunting task. Bringing their new Zelda concept to the world was going to require radical change, change that wouldn't come to fruition for another four years. Even with the next evolution of the Legend of Zelda series well underway, there was an undeniable prevailing sense of uncertainty surrounding the series. Nintendo's decision to rethink the conventions of The Legend of Zelda had the potential to go very well, but things could just as easily go very poorly. So when the December 2013 Nintendo Direct presentation was announced, fans couldn't help but wonder if this was where they'd finally learn something about the new Legend of Zelda. It turns out the answer was... sort of. At the top of the presentation, Nintendo CEO Satoru Iwata announced that the first game shown would be a collaboration between Nintendo and Tecmo Koei, and it would combine the gameplay of their long-running Warriors franchise with the world of The Legend of Zelda. The game was Hyrule Warriors, and the reaction was mixed. Mr. Iwata immediately clarified that this new game was not the next main installment in The Legend of Zelda series, but merely a fun spin-off. The footage looked interesting, but not enough to distract from what fans were really after. Nintendo then hosted another direct presentation in February 2014 without a single mention of either Hyrule Warriors or Zelda for Wii U. Tensions were getting high and speculation was running rampant, but relief finally came four months later. It was with bated breath that the gaming press and fans alike tuned in to Nintendo's E3 2014 presentation for the first proper unveiling of Zelda's new direction. The show started off in an uncharacteristically self-aware form, with direct references to Nintendo's continued refusal to localize Mother 3, Adult Link not wanting Toon Link around, and Satoru Iwata and Nintendo of America president Reggie fils engaging in a martial arts battle to promote Super Smash Bros. for Wii U. It was a remarkably fun presentation, but about halfway through, Zelda series producer Eiji Aonuma took center stage to finally discuss Zelda for Wii U. He began by talking about how the new game's development was being based on the sense of exploration players experienced in the original Legend of Zelda. They had been attempting to recreate this open-world exploration feel in games like The Wind Waker for years, but they were never able to accomplish exactly what they were going for. Now their vision had been realized, and they were ready to share it with the world. As the first footage of the game appeared behind him, he explained that this new world of Zelda was going to be far more vast than anything before, with the ability to reach any area from any direction however you want, effectively jettisoning the more rigid structure the Zelda series had exhibited for years. Then, as the image of Aonuma left the screen, fans were treated to their first taste of what to expect from The Legend of Zelda on Wii U. The presentation immediately moved on to the next game, giving fans no time to process the confusion and excitement over what they had just witnessed. Some were bewildered by the appearance of advanced technology, while others weren't sure the protagonist was even still Link. 
Questions were limitless, but one thing was certain, excitement for the game had never been higher. The new footage successfully impressed, but the game was still a long way off. In the meantime, Zelda fans were about to get a crash course in a very different kind of game. Hyrule Warriors released for the Wii U in September 2014, combining Tecmo Koei's long-running Warriors franchise with elements of The Legend of Zelda. The game put players in a massive battlefield, and it was up to them to utilize over-the-top moves to take down hordes of enemies, while managing the various facets of the battle taking place in multiple locations. Following one of Ganondorf's previous defeats, his soul was split into four fragments and scattered throughout time and space. One was sealed in the Master Sword, while the other three went to the worlds of Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword. Using a sorceress named Sia, Ganondorf was able to open the Gate of Souls and summon an army to attack Hyrule Castle. During the battle, a soldier named Link discovered that he was in possession of the Triforce of Courage. Princess Zelda, though, had disappeared, and so Link teamed up with the Hylian general Impa to track her down. During the course of the adventure, Hyrule Warriors presented players with a unique opportunity to play as a number of different characters from throughout the entire Zelda franchise, many of which were added via updates and downloadable content. Multiple incarnations of Link from games past came with their own unique movesets and art styles, but the playable roster expanded far beyond him to include the likes of Midna, Skull Kid, Zelda, and Ganondorf himself. Even unexpected characters like Tingle, the King of Red Lions, and Ravio made the cut, alongside new characters created just for Hyrule Warriors like Volga and Linkle. The finer points of the game's story get rather convoluted in service of trying to explain how all these characters could coexist in the same universe, but the plot itself was secondary to the fan service on display. Everything from the game's map to its sound effects were an homage to the series' legacy, and while the gameplay didn't catch on with every Zelda fan, most were happy to at least give it a try, which ultimately proved to be a great success, eventually earning the game multiple re-releases and enhancements on future platforms. Three months later, the 2014 edition of the Game Awards were held. During the event, Nintendo hosted a surprise presentation where they showed off the first actual gameplay footage of The Legend of Zelda for Wii U. Series creator Shigeru Miyamoto joined Eiji Aonuma to show early off-screen footage of the game in action and how their experiments had been paying off. The world was massive, requiring the use of the sailcloth from Skyward Sword as well as horses to traverse. The audience was wowed by the game's progress, but even though they made a point of promising it would release in 2015, the wait was going to be much longer than that. Fans would have to get their next Zelda fix somewhere else. That somewhere turned out to once again be the 3DS. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D released in February 2015 for the Nintendo 3DS, giving the N64 cult classic the same treatment as Ocarina of Time four years prior. Termina never looked better, with enhanced textures, improved geometry, and all new character models bringing the world to life like never before. A number of refinements were added in an effort to make the game's three-day cycle and obtuse nature more manageable, but unfortunately not every change was for the better. The game's physics were altered, but the environments were not, leaving certain areas considerably more cumbersome to traverse than in the original, while aspects of its difficulty were lowered to the point of no longer being fun. But in terms of making the game more accessible, it succeeded as many new fans were much more willing to give this iteration a fair shake. Unfortunately, that didn't translate to better sales, with Majora's Mask 3D failing to move even as many copies as its Nintendo 64 counterpart. The reinvention that Zelda for Wii U promised was in dire need, but behind the scenes significant changes were being made, which would lead to the game being delayed even further. However, Nintendo was also working on something else for Zelda fans, and as had been the case so many times before, it wasn't at all what was expected. The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes was released in October 2015 for the Nintendo 3DS, and was once again a multiplayer-focused adventure. Unlike Four Swords though, Triforce Heroes was a three-player affair, and featured an unusual focus on fashion. Some time after the events of A Link Between Worlds, Link traveled to the kingdom of Hytopia. There, Princess Styla had been cursed by a witch to only be able to wear an ugly brown outfit, a fate that caused her to lock herself in a room, sending the kingdom into turmoil. 
King Tuft sent word that he was looking for three adventurers to become something called Totem Heroes, travel the drab lands, track down the witch to lift the curse, and save the kingdom. Naturally, Link answered the call and headed to a castle chamber to talk to an old man who would either help Link begin his adventure by creating two copies of himself to be controlled by other players, or granting him the use of doppels, dolls that could be manipulated for single-player play. Regardless of how many players were involved, one of the game's primary mechanics centered around the three Links having to stand on top of one another to form totems. This forced players to work together to solve puzzles and fight bosses in a unique way, and much like in Four Swords, resulted in an experience that was equal parts cooperative and competitive. As expected, after a number of dungeons, battles, and costume changes, the Lynx were able to defeat the Witch and return Styla to her old self, saving the kingdom in the process. Triforce Heroes had an unusual tone for a Zelda game, standing as the least self-serious entry in the franchise to date. But while the actual gameplay could be very fun with three players, many felt the experience was lacking. Reception was mixed with some outlets awarding it high honors thanks to its clever puzzle design, unique style mechanics, and music in a similar vein to A Link Between Worlds. But others found the single-player game to be somewhat tedious, characters uninteresting, and the overall stakes too low. At the time of its release, it was among the lowest-selling Zelda games ever, only outperforming Four Swords Adventures for GameCube and the CDI games. By 2016, it had been three years since Nintendo released the Wind Waker HD as a holdover for fans who had already been waiting for Zelda on Wii U since 2011. But even after showing gameplay at the Game Awards over two years prior, the game still wasn't ready. Nintendo needed more time, so they once again looked to the past. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess HD released for Wii U in March 2016, bringing Link's most popular adventure to date into high definition for the very first time. Like the Wind Waker HD before it, the game featured upgraded textures, touchscreen inventory management, and several other minor tweaks. However, the result this time around wasn't quite as impressive. Where Nintendo was careful and thorough in making the Wind Waker work as well as possible in high definition without betraying the original's charm, Twilight Princess HD was a much more straightforward port. Textures were enhanced, but the game's inherent art style didn't upscale quite as nicely as Wind Waker's more simplistic design, and since the porting process was outsourced to third-party company Tantalus, some of the finer details like the game's lighting didn't work quite as well as they could have. Still, the enhancements that existed were greatly appreciated, especially the streamlining of the Tears of Light quests, which were a point of contention among fans of the original release. But the Wii U wasn't the only way fans got to revisit the world of Twilight Princess, as 3DS owners were treated to yet another completely different kind of Zelda game. My Nintendo Picross The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess was released on the 3DS in March 2016 exclusively as a reward for My Nintendo Club members. While not exactly a Zelda game in the strictest sense, it was a completely unique version of Nintendo and Jupiter's long-running Picross series themed entirely around The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Picross is a puzzle game where players must use numbers on a grid in order to draw a picture. Each number corresponds with the number of tiles that need to be colored in. Once all the necessary blocks are filled, an image of a character or item from Twilight Princess would be revealed. The further you get in the game, the more complex the puzzles become, with 45 puzzles in all ranging from 10 by 10 grids all the way up to 20 by 15. The action was hosted by Midna, who gave players basic information as they played, while set to a unique musical score based on the themes from Twilight Princess. My Nintendo Picross The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess was a small experience, but a welcome one considering it was effectively free for My Nintendo members and offered fun and engaging puzzle gameplay. Ultimately, though, much like the past several releases in the Zelda series, it was nice, but it was still just a distraction from the bigger picture. Unfortunately, the wait for more information would still be longer, as following this release there would be no news on the Zelda series for over a year. But what waited for fans on the other side was exactly what Nintendo had promised, and if all went well, this new game would be the breath of fresh air the series needed. While Nintendo was eventually able to turn things around for their struggling 3DS hardware, the Wii U wasn't so lucky. 
The usual rumors continued to spread that Nintendo was going to leave the hardware business and become a third-party publisher, or that they were going to be acquired in full by either Microsoft or Sony. But behind the scenes, something far more interesting was happening. Dating back to the 80s, Nintendo always had at least two platforms to support at any given time, a handheld and a home console. But back in January 2013, Nintendo announced that they would be merging their handheld and home console divisions in an effort to streamline their operations. The implications of this ignited no small number of rumors, including adding fuel to the notion that a full-on acquisition was inevitable for the company, but nothing could have been further from the truth. In April 2016, Nintendo released their quarterly financial report. On page 3, buried between paragraphs about 3DS sales and their line of amiibo figurines, Nintendo included an unexpected statement. For our dedicated video game platform business, Nintendo is currently developing a gaming platform codenamed NX with a brand new concept. NX will be launched in March 2017 globally. Naturally, speculation ran rampant, but Nintendo remained completely tight-lipped about any and all details pertaining to the new system. The wait for new information felt to many like a lifetime, as rumors continued to permeate seemingly every Nintendo discussion forum in the world, but with its release date less than a year away, fans wouldn't have to wait long to learn more. At E3 2016, many expected Nintendo to properly unveil the NX to the world. What they did was far more unconventional. Nintendo remained mostly quiet about the NX for the duration of the show, instead turning their entire focus to The Legend of Zelda for Wii U. While it wasn't the only product Nintendo talked about, it was the only game they brought with them to the show floor, as they dedicated their entire booth to that game alone. Fans were treated to a stunning new trailer showing off the game's impressive visual style, atmosphere, and for the first time since the ill-fated CDI games, voice acting. It all ended with the reveal of the game's official title, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. For the remainder of the show, Nintendo publicly demonstrated hours of gameplay footage via their Treehouse Live presentations, but one of the most talked about details wasn't a new gameplay element, but the platforms it would be releasing for. Much like Twilight Princess back in 2006, Breath of the Wild would officially be releasing on both the Wii U and NX. Four months later, in October 2016, Nintendo released a video online breaking down exactly what the NX was. Like many had speculated back when Nintendo had merged their handheld and console divisions, the NX, now officially dubbed Nintendo Switch, was a hybrid console that could seamlessly change between television and handheld formats. The first game shown was Breath of the Wild, but other popular titles like Skyrim and NBA 2K followed suit. The video was a tremendous success, and seemingly erased years of negativity toward Nintendo in an instant. The Switch appeared to be the result of capitalizing on every lesson learned from the Wii U's somewhat disastrous lifetime, and with the basic concept of their mysterious new platform out in the world, people couldn't wait to learn more. Three months later, in January 2017, Nintendo hosted a live presentation finalizing details on the Switch's release. During the show, it was revealed that the console's design incorporated aspects of every previous iteration of Nintendo hardware in an effort to reinvent its video game business, just as Breath of the Wild aimed to do for The Legend of Zelda. As the focus then turned to their new Zelda game, the presentation concluded with Nintendo executives playing coy about its actual release date. This led to an emotional new trailer that finally shed some light on the game's story and confirmed that it would in fact be on store shelves right next to the Nintendo Switch on launch day. It had all been building to this. All the years of experiments, delays, remakes, and side stories had been in service of this bold new direction, not only for The Legend of Zelda, but Nintendo itself. The Switch elicited a level of excitement for a new Nintendo platform that hadn't been prevalent in decades, and in just two months' time, the wait would finally be over. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild released for the Nintendo Switch on March 3, 2017, and as planned, completely changed the way Zelda games were played. Upon starting the game, Link woke up in a strange futuristic pod with no items, no equipment, and not even any clothes. Players were quickly given an item called the Sheikah Slate, and once they made their way out of the cave, the most expansive and alive version of Hyrule ever seen sprawled out before them. 
This area was called the Great Plateau, and it worked as a sort of training ground for new players and veterans alike to learn how this Zelda game played. Link now had a dedicated jump button and could climb nearly any surface with ease. Tree branches could be used as tools or weapons, and apples and other food would restore health instead of the series' trademark heart pickups. It was also here that the game introduced the concepts of towers and shrines. Towers helped Link uncover more of the game's map, while shrines worked as sort of miniature dungeons where players would have to solve puzzles or survive specific combat situations in order to complete them. But no matter what you were doing, the bulk of the game's actions revolved around the mysterious Sheikah Slate, an item that looked suspiciously like a Wii U gamepad. This small tablet not only functioned as Link's inventory and map system, but was upgradable to give him access to new abilities like Stasis, which allowed the player to freeze items in time and build up their kinetic energy to alter their trajectories, and Magnesis, which allowed free control of any objects made of metal. It was by far the most important item in the game, but right behind it was the paraglider. Much of Link's traversal could be done by jumping from high places and using the paraglider to soar through the air, evolving from the sailcloth from Skyward Sword, which itself evolved from the Deku Leaf from Wind Waker. Once some basic tasks on the Great Plateau were completed, Link was given the paraglider, and the immense world of Hyrule was then immediately at his disposal, with complete freedom on where to go. Similar to the original Legend of Zelda, if players wanted to head straight to the end of the game and try to defeat the final boss with nothing but a tree branch and a pot lid, they were welcome to do so. But for those willing to explore, a near limitless amount of rewards awaited them, including an unconventional, potentially non-linear discovery of the game's story. A long time ago, a race called the Sheikah created a civilization of peace and prosperity with the help of advanced technology. They created gigantic machines called Divine Beasts, as well as an army of walking tanks called Guardians to serve as their protectors. Eventually, a great evil known as the Calamity Ganon threatened to reappear and bring destruction to Hyrule, so four champions were chosen to pilot the Divine Beasts, while Zelda and her appointed knight Link faced Ganon head-on. Unfortunately, upon Ganon's return, he took possession of the Divine Beasts and all of the Guardians, killing the King of Hyrule, all four champions, and gravely injuring Link. Zelda sent Link away to be healed while she used her power to seal both herself and Ganon away inside Hyrule Castle. One hundred years later is where the game began, with Link finally healed, but without any of his memories. These can be found throughout the world in fragments, and thanks to the game's unstructured nature, are likely to be discovered out of order, leaving the player to piece together the events of the past to make sense of the future. It was then up to Link to travel Hyrule, reclaim the Divine Beasts, awaken four new champions, recover the Master Sword, and destroy Calamity Ganon. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was an instant hit, handily outselling every other entry in the Zelda series in short order, so much so that it became a genuine phenomenon. For years after its release, images and videos could be found on social media of players experimenting with the game's impressive physics to create all manner of inventions, showcase impressive combat feats, and speedruns. Fans and critics lauded the game as a true generation-defining experience, but not every fan was pleased. In rethinking what a Zelda game could be, some of the series' hallmarks were no longer present in Breath of the Wild, like unique gadgets to help solve puzzles and the series' trademark dungeons, which were replaced by the four divine beasts. The world was so vast that many found it intimidating to even consider finishing, but the biggest complaint of all revolved around the game's controversial weapon durability system. In an effort to force players to try many different weapon options, Nintendo introduced a durability system where any and all weapons would eventually break. While this concept is theoretically sound, everything broke surprisingly quickly, which proved to be a constant source of frustration for many. Swords, spears, bows, shields, they were all prone to destruction, and while replacements were almost always easy to find, the constant management of items grew to be a chore. Regardless, Breath of the Wild was a massive success, and coupled with the Switch hardware accomplished Nintendo's goal of reinventing both themselves and The Legend of Zelda for a new generation. Players spent countless hours exploring every corner of the game's expansive world, and fell in love with some of the most fleshed out and expressive characters the franchise had ever seen. On the same day, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild also released for Wii U, providing an outstanding swan song for the troubled platform. The game contained everything its Switch counterpart did, only with longer load times and a few framerate issues. 
Still, considering the power of the Wii U, the game was a technical marvel and a fitting goodbye to one of Nintendo's most unique home consoles. With Breath of the Wild at long last out in the world, and The Legend of Zelda's popularity at an all-time high, it wasn't long before players in the gaming press began asking what would be next. Following up a game like Breath of the Wild wouldn't be easy, and once again Nintendo went about it in a way that no one expected. In February 2019, Nintendo hosted another one of their direct presentations focused on new games for the Nintendo Switch. It was a fun show as always, but at the very end, Nintendo surprised Zelda fans with a trailer for a game that no one saw coming. A full remake of the Game Boy Classic The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening was coming in 2019, and while the game's graphic style took many by surprise, it was an extremely welcome one, showing that even in the face of the massive success of Breath of the Wild, smaller Zelda adventures still had their place. But that wasn't the only new Zelda game coming that year. One month later, at the 2019 Game Developers Conference in California, Nintendo surprised everyone again with the announcement of yet another 2D Zelda game, but this time it was coming by way of an indie developer and was a crossover with the rhythmic cult hit Crypt of the Necrodancer. It was an exciting time to be a Zelda fan. Breath of the Wild continued to be a rousing success, and now not one but two new Zelda games were coming to Switch in the same year, but Nintendo wasn't done yet. On June 11, 2019, during their E3 Nintendo Direct presentation, more information was given on both the Link's Awakening remake and the Crypt of the Necrodancer spin-off. This was naturally very exciting for Zelda fans, but it was also very expected. What wasn't was how they ended the show. Yet another brand new Zelda game was coming to the Nintendo Switch, and this time it was a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild. A mysterious mummified corpse bearing no small resemblance to Ganondorf came to life amidst a trailer that seemed to show off a much darker follow-up to Breath of the Wild. But no matter what anyone thought of the theoretical tone, the fact that the game was in development at all was very exciting indeed. Fans and the gaming press alike had no shortage of questions on their minds, but Nintendo was as quiet as usual when it came to the details. All anyone knew was the sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was in development, and it looked amazing. But just two days later, players got their chance to try their hands at a different kind of Zelda game, one that would test not only their reflexes, but their sense of rhythm as well. Cadence of Hyrule, Crypt of the Necrodancer featuring The Legend of Zelda, released for the Nintendo Switch in June 2019, just three months after its announcement at GDC. The game saw the main protagonist of Crypt of the Necrodancer, a treasure hunter named Cadence, somehow transported to Hyrule, where a being named Octavo had placed the King of Hyrule under a sleep spell. She then had to join forces with Link and Zelda to find her way home and save Hyrule from ruin. It may have looked like a traditional Zelda game on the surface, but it played quite differently as it was effectively a rhythm game. Players had to move their character around a playfield one square at a time, and every movement, be it attack, defense, or basic traversal, had to be done to the rhythm of the music. Zelda games have historically prominently featured musical instruments, but this time around it was the entire experience that was music-themed, including the boss characters who were clever amalgamations of classic Zelda monsters and musical instruments. Goma became Gomaracas, Gliok became Gliakenspiel, and so on. Cadence of Hyrule was a radical departure from the usual Zelda formula, but it was a successful crossover spin-off that provided fans with a fun new take on the classic world they knew and loved. Not everyone was able to get into this new game though, with many fans unable to get the hang of its unconventional movement patterns. Fortunately for them, something much more familiar was just over the horizon. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening released for Nintendo Switch in September 2019, delivering a somewhat divisive but remarkably faithful remake of the Game Boy Classic. The game's map was nearly a one-to-one -one recreation, except everything was remade from the ground up with a unique visual aesthetic. While the game's cutscenes were portrayed in a style reminiscent of the original's concept art, the in-game visuals looked almost like a toy diorama. The game's overworld was no longer limited to displaying one screen at a time, and now scrolled freely in every direction as you traveled. There was also an optional dungeon building mechanic included, but arguably its biggest quality of life improvement came in the form of inventory management. In the original game, players would have to frequently open and close the pause menu to change items since the Game Boy only had two face buttons to work with. But thanks to the modern controls of the Switch, items like Link's sword never needed to be unequipped, streamlining the gameplay experience considerably. 
It may have looked different, but the original game's soul was still present underneath this new coat of paint, and while many players criticized its visual style and inexplicable frame rate issues, the core of what made Link's Awakening such a special game in the first place was as present as ever, and gave new fans who may have started out on Breath of the Wild an opportunity to learn why classic Zelda titles are still considered classics. Naturally, it didn't take long for fans' focus to turn back to the sequel to Breath of the Wild but their next trip back to that world would be an unconventional one. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity released for Nintendo Switch in November 2020, applying Tecmo Koei's warrior-style gameplay to the world of Breath of the Wild. Unlike the original Hyrule Warriors, Age of Calamity technically acts within the series' official canon, albeit in an unusual way. The game tells the story of a small egg-shaped guardian that traveled to an alternate timeline before the Great Calamity, it was discovered by Link and Impa, who brought it to scientists Pura and Robbie to try and understand what it was and where it came from. Through accessing its memory, they learned of the imposing Great Calamity, so Link and Zelda, as well as the original champions Daruk, Urbosa, Mifa, and Rivali, set out to retrieve the Master Sword and hopefully put a stop to the Calamity before it happened. However, during their quest, they encountered a dark prophet named Astor, who was himself aiming to revive Ganon in hopes of controlling the Calamity for his own ends. The gameplay functioned much like it did in the original Hyrule Warriors, with the player taking control of a number of different characters and using over-the-top attacks to defeat hordes of enemies, while managing multiple skirmishes across a large battlefield. The roster was considerably smaller than the previous games, thanks to it being specifically tied to Breath of the Wild, but the characters were diverse enough to keep things interesting, especially when given the chance to actually pilot the massive divine beasts from Breath of the Wild. In the end, the story did very little to move the overall plot forward, since it took place almost entirely in an alternate timeline but it did provide some interesting insights into the characters' pasts and personalities, and further combined the warrior's gameplay with elements from The Legend of Zelda, including some light puzzle solving. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity quickly outsold every other game in the Warriors series, including the original Hyrule Warriors, and while it provided a fun and unique excuse to travel back to the world of Breath of the Wild, excitement for that game's true sequel continued to rise. But with it still a long way off, Nintendo saw fit to repeat what worked in the past, and offer fans something to tide them over in the form of an often requested remake, one that many thought to be impossible. In a February 2021 Nintendo Direct presentation, series producer Eiji Aonuma made an appearance and immediately clarified that he was not there to give any new information on the sequel to Breath of the Wild. While he did confirm that development was going well and that hopefully more information could be shared later that year, his true purpose was to announce another game to play in the meantime, a full HD remake of The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. This new version didn't just feature a visual facelift, it also included the option to play with traditional button controls, something that fans had been asking for for years. After the trailer, Aonuma explained that fans of Breath of the Wild might find the game's structure jarring, since it was still adhering to the classic Zelda conventions, but also pointed out how many of Breath of the Wild's aspects could be found in the game, and hoped that new players would give it a try while they waited for the sequel. Four months later, during their E3 Nintendo Direct presentation, Aonuma once again appeared to host a segment of the show dedicated to The Legend of Zelda, this time specifically the celebration of the series' 35th anniversary. He started by showing off new details regarding Age of Calamity's downloadable content and the upcoming Skyward Sword HD release, but also showed off a brand new piece of Zelda-themed hardware, The Legend of Zelda Game & Watch, releasing later that year. But the big reveal was what came after. For the first time in two years, Nintendo was finally going to talk more about the sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The trailer highlighted the new game's focus on the sky, yet another parallel to Skyward Sword, and gave a nebulous 2022 release date. There were still far more questions than answers, though, including the game's official title, which Nintendo claimed couldn't be revealed, citing that it could be considered a spoiler as to what the game was all about. So while fans continued to wait patiently for more information on the newest Zelda adventure, they once again traveled back to the earliest story in the series' timeline. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD released for Nintendo Switch in July 2021 and finally gave players the option to experience the game with a standard controller. Like The Wind Waker, Skyward Sword's visual style lent itself well to the high-definition upgrade, with the game's bright colors looking better than ever in HD. 
but it was the controls that proved to be the biggest selling point, thanks to the original game's reliance on motion having turned off so many upon its initial release. The option of motion controls still existed, as the Switch's Joy-Con controllers could be used to mimic the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, but a more standard layout was also available, mapping the movement of Link's sword to the right analog stick. The system wasn't perfect, but it was serviceable, and successfully convinced many new Switch owners to give it a try. Like Nintendo's previous HD remasters, Skyward Sword received a number of quality of life improvements, most notably the game running at 60 frames per second, and the removal of the original's intrusive insistence on explaining what each item Link picked up was every time a save file was loaded. But for the most part, it was still the same great game, only much more accessible. Skyward Sword HD was a moderate success, outselling the original Wii release, but not by much. With the Zelda series' 35th anniversary in full swing, fans were hopeful that Nintendo would release some sort of collection or special edition. Instead, they got this. Game & Watch The Legend of Zelda was released in November 2021 as a means of celebrating the series' 35th anniversary. It contained fully playable versions of both the Japanese and North American releases of The Legend of Zelda, Zelda II The Adventure of Link, and The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, which was re-released here in its original form for the very first time, with all previous re-releases having been based on the colorized DX version. Strangely enough, the original Zelda Game & Watch game was not included on this device. It did, however, contain three completely unique Zelda games. One was a reskinned version of the Game & Watch game Vermin, with Link replacing the original game's protagonist. One was a clock that allowed players to fight off an infinite wave of enemies in the style of the original NES game, with the stages changing depending on the time of day. And one was a sort of survival game, where players faced off against waves of enemies from Zelda II set to a timer. None of these were exactly in-depth experiences, but they were fun additions to an already very nice package. But for as fun a device as the new Game & Watch was, the wait for the next proper Zelda game had grown far longer than anyone had anticipated, including Nintendo. So in March 2022, they officially announced that the sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild would be delayed yet again, this time to Spring 2023. As the year went on, news of The Legend of Zelda continued to be scarce, until the very end of the September 2022 Nintendo Direct. A new trailer for the game was shown, but while it was only a few seconds long, it concluded with the much-anticipated reveal of the game's title and release date. The name was The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, and it would release on May 12th, 2023. With its name and date revealed, it seemed that the game's long development period was nearing an end, and Nintendo was finally confident enough in its progress to start setting some things in stone. In the coming months, more and more details were slowly revealed about both the game's new story and mechanics, until at long last the time had come. Four years after its announcement, there were no more distractions and no more delays. The sequel to Breath of the Wild was finally here. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom released for Nintendo Switch as promised on May 12, 2023, and somehow was an even more expansive game than its predecessor. The game took place on the same map, with almost all of its landmarks appearing in the exact same place as before, only this time there was not one, but two entire new maps to explore. A series of floating islands in the sky, and the depths which spanned the entirety of Hyrule's map with unique locales, enemies, and dangers. Following the events of Breath of the Wild, a mysterious gloom had been covering the land of Hyrule. Zelda and Link determined that its source was coming from beneath Hyrule Castle and set off to investigate. They discovered a series of catacombs with a number of drawings on the walls. Zelda explained that they likely represented the Imprisoning War. As they traveled deeper into the caves, they eventually encountered what appeared to be mummified remains being held in place by a disembodied hand, but upon their arrival, the corpse came back to life and seemed to know exactly who Link and Zelda were, much to their confusion. He then attacked Zelda, causing Link to come to her aid, but the being's overwhelming power easily destroyed the Master Sword, as well as Link's arm in the process. As the being summoned more strength, Zelda fell into a chasm. Link jumped after her, but was unable to catch her in time. Zelda vanished into a mysterious light, and the disembodied hand, which had now sprung to life as well, caught Link and pulled him to safety. He awoke some time later with his own arm having been replaced by the disembodied one. It turned out that this hand belonged to an ancient being named Rauru, and the mummified corpse that returned to life was none other than Ganondorf. 
He used his power to raise Hyrule Castle into the sky, and in the process caused untold amounts of chaos across Hyrule, including dozens of new islands floating in the sky and massive openings to the depths below. It was now up to Link to explore this newly transformed Hyrule, discover a way to repair the Master Sword, find out what happened to Zelda, and travel to Hyrule Castle to face off against Ganondorf. The gameplay itself was quite similar to Breath of the Wild, except instead of the Sheikah Slate, Link used a combination of a new item called the Pora Pad, a sort of evolution of the Sheikah Slate invented by scientists Robbie and Pora, which looked suspiciously like a Nintendo Switch, and Raru's Hand, which could be imbued with a new set of abilities. Replacing Stasis was Recall, an ability that allowed Link to rewind a specific item's place in time, and other new techniques like Ascend and Fuse granted the ability to travel vertically through solid matter and attach items to weapons respectively. But the most important new ability of all was the game's replacement for Magnesis, Ultra Hand. Providing the game's central mechanic, Ultra Hand gave Link full control over nearly any object, metal or otherwise, and any object that was movable could also be attached to anything else in the game. This resulted in a near limitless toolset for players to creatively solve puzzles, traverse the world, defeat enemies, or even just play around for fun. Like Breath of the Wild, players were again granted the freedom to approach the game in whatever order they saw fit. Shrines once again returned, only this time there were even more of them to find, and in response to criticism of Breath of the Wild, dungeons were back and spread across the game's three maps. This was a welcome change for fans, but what unfortunately didn't change was the game's weapon durability system, and even with the new fuse ability slightly extending the life of certain items, it was still considered a nuisance by many. But while some didn't see the merit in what Nintendo had done, even going so far as to call the game nothing more than glorified DLC, the vast majority of players were enthralled by Tears of the Kingdom and all it had to offer. It quickly sold over 10 million copies in its first three days, easily eclipsing Twilight Princess's lifetime sales across all platforms, and making it the fastest selling Zelda game of all time. There are few names in the history of the video game industry that command as much respect as The Legend of Zelda, nor that elicit a more emotional response. The series has changed dramatically during the course of its lifetime, but one thing has remained constant, its ability to resonate with players on every level. Impeccable gameplay, memorable stories, awe-inspiring worlds, unforgettable music, and of course, a fascinating history, all come together to make The Legend of Zelda one of the most beloved names in gaming. Its past may not be perfect, but its future is brighter than ever. So what's next for The Legend of Zelda? Only time will tell, but if history is any indication, it will be legendary.